Spark. I believe I'm in love with Edith Keeler. Jim, Edith Keeler must die. Bridge to all decks. It's time for a brand new episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. I'm Steve Morris, and I feel like we have arrived at a very, very important place in Star Trek history. We have arrived at the portal because we have arrived at an episode that I got to tell you, six months before this date that we are recording this episode, it felt like we are so far away from the top of the heap, from the creme de la creme, from the greatest of what Star Trek truly represents. And here we are. We are at that moment when we are recording our deep dive on the single greatest episode of Star Trek ever produced. And I mean over the last 55 years. And that is the city on the edge of forever. You know what's interesting to me is that there are all these lists of the greatest movies, the greatest this, greatest that. And the one that stays at the top of all the lists, I don't think is everybody's favorite movie, but it's always at the top of the list or almost always. And that is Citizen Kane. Agreed. And I think that's where this is. This might not be everyone's favorite episode. I, I, you know, when you talk about your favorite episode, this is not the episode that you say. That's correct. But I think it is arguably the greatest episode of Star Trek. And that's a really great point because my personal favorite and the episode that I acknowledge as the best are two different things. Yeah. You know, the episode that I love is my favorite, which we'll get to shortly because it's near the beginning of the second season. Of course, that's Metamorphosis. But without question, Steve, I completely acknowledge that City on the Edge of Forever is the best. And I'm glad you brought up Citizen Kane because that is a movie that everyone or almost everyone says is the best. And that is a movie that I feel like is as good as everyone says it is. I feel the same way about The City on the Edge of Forever, which is why I think of City on the Edge of Forever as the Citizen Kane of Star Trek. Well, and the thing too, I think, is that Citizen Kane is also unique. Like Citizen Kane isn't like other movies. It is very much its own thing. And City on the Edge of Forever is unique. Even though it has all incredible Star Trek elements, it's also very, very different. It's its own thing. It is absolutely its own thing. And I'm trying to put myself in the, the head of the producers, the writers, and especially the actors. When they got their shooting script for City on the Edge of Forever, and they read this and went, Whoa. And then when they got the shooting script for the episode that came after this, which was Operation Annihilate, and they went, Oh, oh, oh well, <laughs> right? you know, like we're back. Uh, but this episode in particular, there is no question that, that it is revered and universally praised for all of the right reasons. But Steve, was it always praised in your life being just such a devoted fan? You know, it's funny, knowing that you're going to ask that question, I, I've been thinking about it, and I think I grew into it. That's what I actually think. Because as a little kid, it was the adventure and the sci-fi and the monsters and the, you know, like those kind of more swashbuckling episodes I think I was drawn to. And I, th I think it was more junior high or high school where I started to go, man, this episode's really good. And I think it was when I discovered was became a more interested in the drama and b more interested in the Kirk Spock relationship. And just because I think this is the peak. I think that Kirk and Spock in this episode are just, this is the ideal. And it, I think it took me a while to grow into it. It is the ideal. And there is something really unique about the Kirk Spock relationship in this episode. Something that I only just, just now realized and discovered while I was prepping for this deep dive, something I never really noticed before, or at least I didn't notice in the way that I think it'll make a really good point of discussion when we get to this moment in the episode. I've always loved this episode. Like you, when I was growing up, I preferred the action adventure episodes like the Doomsday Machine, Mirror Mirror, uh, certainly Balance of Terror. But it took, as I, as I got older, as I certainly got into into really reviewing movies and really breaking down structure and appreciating what makes a great movie a great movie. And as far as the original series goes, I feel like this is as cinematic as the original series got. And 
the elements that I've grown to appreciate, like you, I think I had to grow into them. And I appreciate so many things about them as a grown up that I did not appreciate while, while I was growing up. Right. But it aired on April 6, 1967, which made it the 28th episode to air. It was filmed between February 3rd and February 14th, 1967. It took seven and a half days for this episode to be filmed, which means it went a day and a half over schedule. It was the 29th episode of the original, original series to film. Now, when I break down the budget for these episodes, this one's a little tricky because there, there are two numbers that I've seen. The first number was around $245,000. Wow. wow. Now, Steve, if you remember, you know, we've been talking about the budgets. Their first season per episode budget by the end of the first season was around $185,000. So this first cost of around two forty five already puts it at more than sixty thousand dollars over budget, which already makes it outside of the two pilots the most expensive episode of the original series as part of its regular production series. But the second number that I came across, and this one comes courtesy of a brand spanking new book called Star Trek as Celebration, which is brand new, hmm. brand new coffee table book with a lot of stuff in it that even I did not know. Oh. And I have to say, Steve, a lot of very cool photos hmm. that I have never seen. So the new number that I came across is actually $250,396. So that's the number I'm going with because it's more recent so that puts this $65,396 over budget. The score, now, for the last few episodes, the score had been tracked, pulled from other episodes. But Fred Steiner returned to record a partial score. Mm. And you'll know what that is when we get to it in our discussion. But as far as Sitting on the Edge of Forever being revered, it is also an award winning episode, having won the 1968. Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation. The next time a Star Trek episode would win a Hugo Award would be 25 years later with the Next Generation episode, The Inner Light. And incidentally, when Sitting on the Edge of Forever won its Hugo Award, the other four nominees were episodes of Star Trek, The Trouble with Tribbles, The Doomsday Machine, Mirror Mirror, and Amok Time. So among those five, would you? Have picked sitting on the edge of forever to win the win the award. Of course, I would. <laughs> That's, and, and those are good episodes. But there's not. I mean, to me, there's not even a comparison with with any of those. Um, the, well, you know, it's interesting that just occurred to me because I I figured it would be in the Inner Light, which is uh, which would also win the award. There's a connection between Inner Light and City on the Edge of Forever. What's the connection? They're both. Uh, the captain has this experience that is tragic and that is deep and profound. And then they have to go back and they both have a time travelish element to them. You know, it's the captain goes off into this world, has a deep, profound experience, and then they are changed when they come back to the enterprise. Uh, absolutely. Completely agree with you. The interesting thing about inner light is uh, that Picard has this experience. That's not, not, not his, right. you know, it's a time travel episode of sorts, but completely different in terms mm -hmm. of its scope and its tone than the one that Kirk has in City. So the other award that City on the Edge of Forever won, and this is really interesting, Steve, is that it won the Writers Guild Award oh. for Best Written Dramatic Episode. But here's the catch, my friend. The version of City that won the Writers Guild Award was Harwin Ellison's original version of the teleplay, hmm. not the version of the episode that actually aired. So Harlan Ellison won his Writer's Guild Award for Star Trek for a version of Star Trek that was never actually produced. Wow. And when he won his award, well, I'll save his speech <laughs> when we get uh, to the aftermath of Sitting on the Edge of Forever. When I say aftermath, uh, I mean a big aftermath because more than any other episode of the original series, this one came with a lot of controversy. A lot of headaches. It was rewritten many, many times to the ire of Harlan Ellison, its writer, 
uh, and a deep dissatisfaction that Harry, he carried with him to his final days when he passed away in 2018. Harlan Elson, though, was one of the first writers that Gene Roddenberry hired to be a part of Star Trek. And at that time, he was a big, big champion. And he, he wrote about how this is, this is not going to be like other TV shows, like other science fiction TV shows like Lost in Space. This is going to be really serious, which is why they got other revered science fiction writers like Theodore Sturgeon and Richard Matheson. Now, Harlan Ellison uh, also won Writers Guild Awards for The Outer Limits for Demon with a Glass Hand, The Star Lost for an episode called Voyage of Discovery, and for the Twilight Zone episode Paladin of the Lost Hour. That's from the uh, revised version of the Twilight Zone from Mm. the mid-1980s, which is really, really good. And he also won another Hugo Award for 1975's A Boy and His Dog, based on his original material. He also wrote other episodic TV shows uh, like Route 66, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and Babylon 5. And he was also the creator of the series called The Star Lost, but as he was credited as Cord Wainer Bird, not Hmm. Harlan Ellison. I'll get to that. In a moment, okay. too. And he also has books and collections which have been revered for decades, like Deathbed Stories, Again, Dangerous Visions, Strange Wine, and Shatter Day. As far as its evolution, I'm going to do something different with this episode, Steve. Instead of just running through all the differences uh, I'm, uh, as the outlines and the teleplays have progressed, I'm going to go through them as we get to the end of each act Mm. during our deep dive so we can really break down the differences between the original versions, the revisions, and the final version that aired. But I will say that Harlan Ellison's story outline came very, very early on March 21st, 1966. Wow. And he was uh, rewritten by the likes of Stephen Karabatsis, Jean Kuhn, Dorothy Fontana, and of course, Gene Roddenberry. But one thing I do want to note about Sitting on the Edge of Forever, Steve, I've talked many times now about the photo novels. Yes. The photo novels, which I still say you should have. I I feel like you should get a commission on every (laughs) used sale of these photo novels. You've been doing regular advertisements for them. Well, for everyone who has even just one of the photo novels, but definitely if you have your set, take a picture of yourself with your favorite (laughs) photo novel and make sure you post it on our Enterprise Incidents Facebook page because love I love those photo novels. I think that they are really like the uh, the rosebud of my Star Trek collection. Uh, but you know, Gene Roddenberry and Bob Justman had been really trying hard to keep Harlan Ellison on target with writing the screenplay. He wrote it very, very slowly because he was writing so many other things. And they had asked him to make so many changes that Ellison refused to make. And then at one point, they actually sent William Shatner to Harlan Ellison's home wow. to try and appeal to him to make certain changes. But according to Harlan Ellison's recollection about the meeting when Shatner came to his home, all Shatner was really interested in was how many lines he had <laughs> <laughs> versus how many lines Leonard Nimoy had. So uh, <laughs> not the best ambassador. Not the yeah. best ambassador. And and I can't really I find it hard to dispute Ellison's uh, allegation with that. But uh, again, there's so much to say about the making of this episode as there is about the episode itself. And I think there really isn't another episode of the original series quite like it. You know what's interesting? And and then I'll jump into sort of the things going on in the world. But uh, having done the cinephiles for so many years, there are great films that were clearly the vision of someone and they made the movie that they wanted to make. But there's a whole bunch of other great films that had multiple writers, multiple rewrites, all sorts of chaos, and made some of the greatest films of all time. You know, Casablanca being a great example, Gone with the Wind being a great example, Jaws was constantly written, Apocalypse Now was constantly rewritten, all sorts of chaos. And it's amazing to me that out of all of this chaos, and I'm really curious to hear what some of it was, that you get this incredible episode of television. And and you know what's interesting? You know, you mentioned those movies. And with the exception of Apocalypse Now, you know, you watch some of these movies. Like I just, I just was uh, doing some reading about the movie Tootsie mm. with Dustin Hoppin, directed by Sidney Powell. Apparently, that was a very huge chaos, a lot of chaos yeah. on that film. But when you watch the movie, 
you would you would swear that it was easy to make. Like it looks so seamless. And I think that that applies to sitting on the edge of forever as well. You would never know unless you were like a, a diehard fan or even just a scholar of old Hollywood that there was so much chaos behind the scenes. You, you want to know a quick story I know about that film is uh, the screenwriters, two screenwriters won the Oscar. It's Larry Gelbart, who is creator of MASH and show shows and wrote Oh God and all sorts of great stuff. And another screenwriter whose name I don't remember. They get the Oscar. They go up on stage. That is the first moment that Larry Gelbart met the other guy. Oh, wow. They had never met because he, Larry Gelbart wrote the original screenplay and then it was taken out of his hand and went to different writer, different writer, different writer, went to this other guy. Then it went back to Larry Gelbart, who did the final polish. And then what happens is the WGA looks at the Writers Guild, looks at all the versions, and then they give out the credit. And they, so they said, well, Larry Gelbart and this other guy share credit. He never met him. Well, I, I have a great quote from Dorothy Fontana, which I'll read to you when we get to the end. Uh, that kind of sums up her feelings about working with Harlan Ellison, who, <laughs> by the way, she considered a very, very dear friend. Mm. The people who who really loved Harlan Ellison, like Dorothy Fontana, like I believe David Gerald was also really good, good friends with Harlan. David Gerald wrote Trouble Triples. He also wrote The Cloud Miners from the third season. Uh, the people who defend Harlan Ellison, defend him with passion. But there are, there are, you know, when you, when you look at all of this, when we get through all of this during the deep dive, Steve, I, I really want to know, as we're going along, do you think that these changes were right for to make a better episode that fit in with the tone of the rest of the series? I can't wait to hear them. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, this was a film between February 3rd and February 14th. So it's a longer, I'm assuming there was a three-day weekend somewhere in the middle there. Yep. And that's why it ended up being so long. So I have a little bit more than I normally do about what was going on in the world. The first thing is on February 4th, tensions between China and the Soviet Union were going higher and higher to the point that that the Soviet Union sent troops to Mongolia along the Chinese border because they were getting worried that they were going to go to war. I mean, it's really a scary moment. Um, in Nicaragua, Somoza was elected. I put quotes <laughs> around that president. Um, he's part of a, you know, a political family line that had run that country for a while. He won 70% of the vote, apparently. Wow. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Amazing how that worked out. Um, on the same day, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour made its debut on TV. For those people who know, this is one of the most important shows of the late 60s. This was super controversial, represented the counterculture, did all sorts of things. I think it was on CBS. Now I can't remember. I remember George Harrison was on it. Yeah. And there was, you know, things where the different stations wouldn't carry it. And finally it was canceled in 1969 on February 6th, Muhammad Ali depended his title against Ernie Terrell. And anyone who knows about this fight is in this, this is the fight. He had changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. And there were some people that were using Muhammad Ali and some people refused to. And Ernie Terrell refused to use the name Muhammad Ali continued to refer to him as Cassius Clay in the ring. Muhammad Ali repeatedly yelled at him, what's my name? What's my name? While he literally beat the crap out of him. You know what? He had a comment to him, didn't he? Yeah. And, there's a, and it went 15 rounds and there was a lot of people that think that, that he basically kept, chose not to knock him out and kept torturing him for 15 mm. rounds to because of being disrespected. I want is that on YouTube or something? I would oh, yeah. love oh, to see Oh, you that. could see this fight. And and you know, this is Mah this is peak Muhammad Ali. This is before he lost his title and had the years off. This is when nobody could touch him. Mm, amazing. Um, uh, a legend. On the 7th, Mickey Dolans met Paul McCartney at his house in London. Whoa. Yeah. Was he did he go to a session? I wonder if Mickey Dolans went to a Beatles session. I, I, it's a really good question. On the 8th, Lyndon Johnson sent a letter to Ho Chi Minh, the president of North Vietnam, saying, hey, <laughs> this is not how he said it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ho. <laughs> uh, he said, hey, if you guys stop invading the South, we'll stop bombing the North. Needless to say, that didn't work that out. That did not work out. Maybe it was the hay. <laughs> I think probably, probably. It was just not respectful. Um, it didn't translate more well into Vietnamese. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, on the same day, cellist Charlotte Mormon was arrested in New York City for playing the Brahms lullaby. 
I mean, she was playing it topless, and so that's probably oh, why that, she was arrested. I have something to do with it. <laughs> on, on the 10th, the 25th Amendment was ratified, and this is something we've heard a lot about recently. This is changing the rules at, at which the succession of the presidents happens and giving uh, the cabinet the power to remove the president mm. if they're unfit for office. That's That was passed. Um, on the same day, Lawrence, Laura Dern and Vince Gilligan were born. On uh, February 12th, there was a raid at Keith Richards' house where they busted him and Mick Jagger for drugs, for drugs. Those were the days. Yeah. In Vietnam, the first infantry division launched what they believe was the largest gas attack in the entire Vietnam war. 11 Chinook helicopters carried 30, 55 gallon drums each of tear gas, 25,000 pounds, which they bombed dropped on Viet Cong targets. They went down to the ground, found out the Viet Cong had left the day before. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Um, and on February 13th, speaking of the Beatles, do you know what came out? February 13th. Wait a minute. February 13th, uh, 1967. Yep. I'm going to say that was the release of one of the most important singles of all time. Uh, Penny Lane back with Strawberry Fields. You are 100% correct. Oh my gosh. My faith in you is, is continues. <laughs> I, I felt that was a tough one, but I thought you would get it. Well, I mean, the, you know, when they went in the recording studio, when they went back to Abbey Road in the uh, fall of 1966, they had taken a few months off after their last concert, which was on August 29th. And, and just uh, maybe 10 days after their last concert, and they called the quits from touring, is when Star Trek premiered. So when they went back to the recording studio, they had the mustaches, and they recorded- right. When I'm 64 and Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, and they had intended to make an album about their childhoods, but mm. then EMI said, no, no, you got to put something out. It's been, you know, you haven't had any kind of new material out since last summer with the Revolver. So they hastily, and I use that word very loosely with big quotes around it, hastily released Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, which is, is hailed as one of the most important pop singles of all time next to good vibrations by the beach boys it'll be really interesting when after we're done with the enterprise incidents we start our beatles podcast i'm down with that <laughs> i'm absolutely down with the beatles podcast. I wonder, has anyone done that gone like album by album a deep dive on a the deep beatles dive on the beatles i'm sure they have but not the way we would do yeah. it the thing is though i i am not a music expert like I love the Beatles and, and, and you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of the Beatles. That's why we would be a great team on the Beatles as well. We'll have yeah. to figure out what to call it. Yeah, that's true. Very good. We, we, I think we need to get okay, a musician. Let's, let's keep that on the shelf next <laughs> right. to the Let It Be tapes. There you go. Um, <laughs> are you ready? Oh my gosh. I have been waiting for this moment for six months and I cannot believe that we are actually about to do our deep dive on not just the greatest Star Trek of them all, but one of the finest hours of dramatic television in Hollywood history, bar none. You know, we talked about teasers and how good they are. This teaser, it starts right in the middle of the action, right on the red alert, right on the bridge of the Enterprise, shaking. There's something going on. We don't waste a second's time. Stay on top of it, Mr. We're holding orbit, sir. The helm is sluggish. This is a, a fantastic opening. You just see the Enterprise orbiting this planet, which does not have a name, and the the way that the turbulence is is rocking the Enterprise, and and they're 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 swaying back and forth, and the dramatic score underneath it. Uh, this is clearly what the Enterprise was out in deep space for, exploring a strange new world, and there's some very strange activity going on on the planet that's affecting the Enterprise. You mentioned the way the ship is moving. What I do think it's interesting that these are not like, we've seen lots of shakes of the Enterprise. This is more like they're on the ocean. Mm -hmm. There's like mm -hmm. waves going through in addition to the shakes, which is not a big deal, but it's like, here's a choice, you know, that's different. And then right at that moment, huge sparks at the helm and Sulu goes down. Sigfei, the bridge. Now this episode was filmed on day five on stage nine, all the bridge scenes were, were filmed on day five because other than the teaser and the beginning of the first act, we don't see the right. Enterprise again for the rest of the episode. But within seconds, you have this explosion at the helm that knocks Sulu out and Kirk frantically calls for sickbay to come to the bridge. And in the midst of that, what we hear that's happening is that they are actually passing through ripples of time. Inform Starfleet Command that apparently 
something or someone down on this planet. And he doesn't finish the sentence because at that moment, McCoy enters to take care of Sulu. So McCoy leans down by Sulu and so heart flutter, better risk a few drops of cordrazine. It's tricky stuff. Are you sure you want to risk? Sulu comes to with a mighty fine smile on his face. The exact smile he had when he was mm. possessed by Landrew, the exact smile he had when he was possessed by the spores in this side of paradise. So uh, say this about George Takei, when he gets happy, he gets very happy a, and it's it's great commitment. He's <laughs> got a very nice smile. And I love, A, I love the joke. You were about to make a medical comment, Jim. Who, me, doctor? That is Gene Kuhn. Yes. Yeah. That is absolutely Gene Kuhn. You know, when we get into into just all the different variations and all the different elements that the writers brought to it. One thing that Gene Kuhn absolutely brought to it for sure was the humor and the levity, even in moments of high drama, just like this. Two things about this. The first is I won't, won't talk. We talked about it endlessly, but Kirk's a nerd. He has read about Cordrazine. He knows that it's serious stuff. Oh my gosh, you're right. Second thing is this, for those screenwriters out there, this is how you do exposition because the, what they have to get out is that this is a dangerous drug. That's what's important. And you do it through a moment of conflict and levity. I want to get back to your first thing. Okay. I never thought about that before. But he what well, he knew. He knows what Cordrazine is. He's yeah. not a doctor, but he is a nerd. He read that book, man. He read that book just like all the other books that he had on his stack with legs. And again, we're setting up, it's just beautifully setting up the moments of disaster because we hear that we've plotted all the ripples so we're going to be okay except there's one that seems really heavy and at that moment we see mccoy looking at that full hypo that is a perfect setup you know the moment before the disaster is and, coming. and, and it, it's been all set up to this moment the turbulence the time ripples mccoy being called to the bridge it is a perfect storm that leads to this moment when that last bit of turbulence shakes the Enterprise in such a way that it knocks McCoy off his feet and he falls onto his full hypo, injecting himself with a full vat of Cordrazine, knocking himself out. Oh. And then McCoy jumps to the overdose of Cordrazine, taking its full effect. Killers! Assassins! I will let you! I'll kill you first! We've never seen McCoy like this. We've never seen DeForest Kelly put in a performance like this. And this is just the tip of the iceberg for the range that DeForest Kelly displays in this episode. You know what it reminds me of, by the way, is Dr. Van Gelder. I think, I think DeForest Kelly puts in the same amount of intensity to this performance that he did in Dagger of the Mind. Uh, that's a great point. I'm still, I'm still kind of floored by your, you know, tying into the nerd, the nerd <laughs> element of, of Captain Kirk, but, but um, perfect. The one thing I will say, I don't think Kirk and Spock do a very good job of restraining McCoy at this moment. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> just, we just proved very recently that Spock is way stronger than the ordinary human and McCoy just slips right out. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. I think that the way that this moment is, is directed is a little clumsy, but at the same time, I think that everyone on the bridge, including Kirk and Spock are in such, such shock and yeah, disbelief. They're shook up. Yeah. They've, they've never seen McCoy like this and they don't, don't realize the extent to which, even though he's screaming at the top of his lungs, they don't realize the extent to which that the Cordrazine has affected him until he does run off the bridge. Security alert. That is a teaser. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is, there's not a wasted move. I mean, this is, you know, again, talking about good filmmaking, good screenwriting, is that if there are lines that you could take out, generally you should. And so if you watch an episode of television and there's some stuff where it's like, man, we probably didn't need to hear that. That's a weaker episode of television. There is not a wasted moment, almost in the entire episode. There, there is not a wasted moment. And guess what? If they were going to do this episode in one of the newer Star Trek shows today, they would have turned it into a 10 episode arc. <laughs> But they didn't need to do that in the original series because ultimately they had a great writer and great rewriters yeah. who turned this into a perfect 50-minute episode. And when we come back into Act 1 and we see that the title is The City on the Edge of Forever, have you ever given thought 
to what that title means? I ha- I have. I mean, and what I for me, what it's always meant is that this is New York City at this moment where the future of the galaxy, the future of the human race hangs on the balance. It is on the edge of its own destiny. That is absolutely correct. The title does Woo-hoo! refer to both not only the dead city on the planet that the portal, that the guardian right. exists, but also New York City, where the timeline will either be restored or permanently disrupted. Yep. And first of all, it's a poetic title. Captain's log, supplemental entry. Two drops of cordrazine can save a man's life. A hundred times that amount has just accidentally been pumped into Dr. McCoy's body. We have no way of knowing if the madness is permanent or temporary or in what direction it will drive McCoy. Well, security is looking for McCoy, who has got himself down to the transporter room. Uh, Transporter Chief Kyle has his back to the door. He doesn't hear the door open, but that's okay. And John Winston, once again, playing uh, Chief Kyle. So McCoy knows exactly where to hit him to knock him out. And he takes his phaser. I don't know why he's wearing a phaser in the transporter room, but that's okay. You know, these are are minor little uh, plot point contrivances that you look past because they it does they do advance the story because that phaser will come back into the story later in this episode but then mccoy beams himself down to the planet one thing that i think is interesting do you remember in this side of paradise where mccoy was threatening sandoval and it sounded like he was going to fight you know what mccoy can fight mccoy can fight you're right he knew exactly this where, where good to move hit he put on this guy. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, one interesting thing I noticed on the bridge is that when Kirk comes back on the bridge, there is it, it's totally minor, but there's an African American guy in a yellow shirt who enters after him. Mm-hmm. And I think that is just great extra casting that they said we want to reinforce that there are officers on this ship that are of all different races. I, you know what? I absolutely noticed that. And I, I thought to myself, even from a young age, how cool is that, that you have all this diversity on the Enterprise and it's there without drawing attention to it. Right. It's just there because it belongs there. Yep. And the message goes up to the bridge that McCoy has beamed himself down. And the transporter at that time, Captain, was focused on the center of the time disturbance. So whatever's down there, McCoy's in the heart of it. And we see this big landing party beam down to this planet. And I remember from a very early age stage, the first thing I noticed about the way this planet was shot was the lighting, courtesy yeah. of cinematographer Jerry Finnerman. Absolutely. It looks amazing. I also think the sound design on this planet is great. It has a creepy, totally different from what we've heard before sound. And the other thing I notice is Uhura's in the landing party. Is this the first time that she's in a landing party? It is the first time she's in a landing party and also part of the landing party is Scotty. Yep. So this is a big landing party. You have security, you have your your first officer, your your science officer, you have your engineer, your communications officer. And you know, you could look at it and say like why do all these people need to be there? But there's a lot going on in this planet that they don't understand. So I think maybe it is important to have communications there. I think it is important to have your your engineer there to determine like what these time disturbances are and how they're affecting the run of the enterprise. It makes perfect sense. So I don't think it makes perfect sense. I don't think it makes a lot of sense at all, but because what I actually think would make sense, wouldn't you want to have like a nurse or a doctor being down with you? You're trying to get a guy who's really sick. Of course. That would seem more intelligent than this. But this is the thing is that the reason they're down there is we like these characters. It's not about what their jobs are. And I bet there was a conversation with Nichelle Nichols being really unhappy and saying, please give me something to do. Possibly. I agree with that. I mean, sure. Uh, Remember when we were talking about Return of the Archons, you know, she was on the bridge and had nothing to say. Yeah. I agree. Something must have come out of that. Even though she doesn't have a lot of dialogue, and even though after the first act, you know, we don't see her again until the very final moments, uh, there must have been a conversation there. Of course, we don't know for sure, uh, but it makes sense that there would have been. But this scene, the planet scenes were filmed on stage 10, which is where all the planet scenes. Right. In fact, all the exteriors were filmed except one that was actually shot on another stage that I'll get to later in this episode. But they started filming this particular scene on the planet on day six of filming Cindy on the Edge of Forever. And we 
we're we're told, you know, after establishing the mood, the lighting, sort of the, the planet sounds, the planet vibrations, that eerie music that I love. I love that eerie score that this is 10,000 centuries old. Which and is then, a million years. It would be which, probably an easier way to say that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's more dramatic to say it's like 10,000 centuries old than yeah. say a million years, but a million does sound, sound pretty, pretty <laughs> old. So what we see in the distance is this object, an object that catches their eye. So this object, as we, as we come to learn, is called the Guardian of Forever. And so what happened was Matt Jeffries was the set designer. He was also the creator of the Enterprise right. and the Romulan Bird of Prey. So he was out sick the week that they were prepping City on the Edge of Forever. So the Guardian was actually designed by Rowan M. Brooks, who was the art department chair. And what he did was he had tubes push carbon dioxide fog down the backside of the Guardian. And the lighting effects were designed by Jim Rook. Well, when Matt Jeffries came back to work and he saw the donut-shaped Guardian, he was quoted as saying, what the hell is this? But I think <laughs> the Guardian looks awesome. What do you think? I like it a lot. I mean, so I watched this last night with my wife and son. Oh, it's one whoa. of the few ones I've gotten them to watch. What did uh, they think? <laughs> Jax loved it. I mean, he made jokes about it too, because he's 10 years old in the world of the greatest special effects in history. And now he's watching an old Star Trek episode. And so mm -hmm. he made some jokes about this particular set. And I had to, and, and when the, you know, the smoke, the fog started coming down, he's like, oh, it's just, they're just like blowing smoke. That's silly. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> 1967 <laughs> 55 years ago give cut it some slack this is cutting edge in <laughs> this is older than me um i think it's a really cool design i like it a lot i think it's an iconic design absolutely it is and they're walking around it trying to figure out what's going on and, and then there's this moment i just have to ask you about is spock says unbelievable captain and i think kirk says that's funny what what's that there was a line that was cut so what was cut i don't know the line that was cut but there was a line in and where Kirk is reacting to something that we don't even know what he's reacting to. But I always thought about that too. It, it's so funny. We've now had like three things where in this incredible episode where we tiny little nitpicks, <laughs> and that is definitely one of them. This single object is the source of all the time displacement. Explain. I can't. For this to do what it does is impossible by any science I understand. And we're searching for McCoy. And then we see that they are not good searchers. <laughs> and McCoy's hiding places are not that tricky. But McCoy pops up looking completely crazed. I guess there are only so many places he could he could hide on stage 10. Exactly. <laughs> Incredible power. It can't be a machine as we understand mechanics. And what is it? A question. You hear the voice of the Guardian from Bart LaRue, who was seen as the TV announcer in the episode Bread and Circuses. Oh. Uh, and he was, uh, his voice was used many times uh, throughout Star Trek. But when you hear Bart LaRue with the reverb in his voice, a question and the lighting on the Guardian, I, I don't care if it's 1967, by today's standards, that still looks pretty cool the way the Guardian lights up in unison with. Bart LaRue's voice. Since before your sun burned hot in space and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. And that is one, one of two lines to survive from Harlan Ellison's mm. original screenplay. Word for word, it's one of the only lines to survive. Wow. Another line comes much, much later in the episode, and I'll let you know what that is. But I just love that line, since before your son burned hot in space and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. That's a long time. So does that mean the Guardian has been alone that whole time? Yep. Because Spock says this is uh, 10,000 centuries, which is a million years. Our son's 4 billion years old. Billion, 4 billion years old. That's a long time. Spock was wrong. Yeah. Not the first time. <laughs> because Spock even says in this episode, he was a fool for not recording. That's true. So, so Spock as, as while not per, uh, close to perfect, he, he's close to perfect, but he's not perfect and he is flawed. Are you machine or being? I am both and neither. I am my own beginning, my own ending. 
I see no reason for answers to be couched in riddles. My answer is simply as your level of understanding makes possible. Immediately, you sense an irritation between Spock and the Guardian. I think Leonard Nimoy could do a masterclass on reaction shots. There, and, and in this episode, just basically, you could watch this whole episode and just watch Nimoy. He's so interesting. He's so funny. And this is one of those moments where there's just a little look. I, you know what I wonder? Because we don't really know what... I, I know that the Guardian of Forever has become a thing that is in Star Trek canon and has been referenced in various places. It seems to me that if it is from uh, before our sun burned in space, and if he is his own beginning and his own ending, then in some level, the Guardian of Forever exists outside of time. You know what I mean? Oh, I completely agree yeah. with that. Sure. Like, it wasn't like it was built a really, really long time ago. It's that it has existed beyond time. It has existed beyond time. And the race that lived on this planet, and there was a race because- there There's are, ruins, yeah. There are ruins. So whatever race lived there has evolved, flourished, and become extinct. And the Guardian is still going. Yeah. I think even just talking about that, that length of time in which the Guardian has been dormant, waiting for a question, is actually pretty chilling. A time portal, Captain. A gateway to other times and dimensions, if I'm correct. And the Guardian says, As correct as possible for you. Man, the Guardian lays down some nasty shade, man, when he yes, wants he to. <laughs> the Guardian is a bit condescending. Again, that's the hand <laughs> of Gene Kuhn, who just brought levity. Levity that coexists in moments of high drama, just like this. Behold. And then you see within the portal. Stock footage. Yeah, stock footage. <laughs> either newsreel footage or old movie footage. But it works, and it's just going by. Mm -hmm. Again, the way that it's lit, the way that it's directed, the way that the music score, it is still after hundreds, and I mean hundreds of times watching this episode, it still gives me the chills to watch Kirk and even Spock in awe at what the Guardian is displaying. A gateway to your own past, if you wish. It's one of those other places like the planet Omnicron City 3, where it's like, man, there was probably reasons to go back there. <laughs> that we And I know we revisit the Guardian later in other shows. Killers! McCoy yells. Killers! I want to get me. I'll kill you first. I want to get assassin. And they grab him, and we use the famous Spock neck pinch. <laughs> and I like how Kirk motions yeah. for Spock. He's <laughs> like, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, after you. Uh, he, they, you know, they don't phase for him. They don't use a hypo to knock him out. Spock knocks him out with the neck pinch. Well. And, and again, this is, I mean, these are silly nitpicks, but it's like, this is why it would have been a good idea to have Nurse Chapel here, because here's this guy in horrible distress, could be dying. <laughs> you just kind of leave him while you marvel at the Guardian. The choices that Kirk has made in putting together the landing party has been called into question. Remember in the ultimate computer? Mm. Oh uh, yeah, you know, that's a good so, point. So here's Kirk, okay, and, and he you know, sends a big landing party down. Maybe, you know, a couple of the choices weren't the most uh, wise. Uh, and you're right. I agree with you. Nurse Chapel should have been there. And then Kirk, always the schemer, always trying to come up with a way to trick his way out of things, suddenly goes. If that is a doorway back through time, could we somehow take Bones back a day in time, then relive the accident? This time, be certain that the hypo accident is avoided. Be careful what you wish for, James T. Kirk. Strangely compelling, isn't it? To step through there and lose oneself in another world. And that's when Spock, who is also in awe at the power and the scope of the Guardian, realizes what he had been missing. I am a fool. A tricorder is capable of recording even at this speed. And at that moment, McCoy leaps out. Scotty calls for him. Dr. McCoy, bones no! He jumps through the time portal and at that moment, the Guardian stops projecting the past. He has passed into what was. I want to just highlight, by the way, the slow motion and the way he jumps through that the Guardian. It's really cool visually. It looks great. Um, and at this moment, Uhura has lost contact with the ship. Suddenly it went dead. No static, just nothing. Scotty opens his communicator. Nothing wrong with the communicator. Your vessel, your beginning. All that you knew is gone. 
So McCoy has somehow changed history. Steve, I have a question for you. Yes. The first true time travel episode of Star Trek. Okay, naked time, yeah, they went back in time three days, but that was like an afterthought. wasn't really part of the plot of the whole episode. So the first true time travel episode of Star Trek was what? It was uh, Tomorrow's Yesterday. Tomorrow's Yesterday. Okay, so here you have the Enterprise in the 20th century. About 30 years later, or 35 years later, or almost 40 years later, from when they eventually go back into the past in this episode. So here's the question, or here's the point. In the sick bay, when they're trying to figure out, okay, so here we are in the 20th century. The Enterprise is in the 20th century. What do we do? So Kirk is warned, the longer we stay in the past, there are 420 chances of altering the future. Who? warns Kirk with that prophecy. I don't, is it McCoy? I don't, it's McCoy. Oh, I didn't McCoy remember that. McCoy is in sick bay, and he says, what do we do? Stay up here and wait, our, wait for our supplies right. to run out? And he says, if we stay in the past, the Enterprise stays here, that's 420 chances of altering the future. And now we see that it is McCoy who goes back in time to alter the future. By sheer coincidence, by bitter irony, it is the person who warned Kirk of the dangers of, of time travel and being in the past as the one who went back in time to change the future. Interesting. You know, the thing I was thinking about is I don't know what the first I messed up the time in the past story is. There probably is some earlier science fiction story, I'm sure. But this is the first one for me. And, Great. There's, and there's so many where we see whether it's Back to the Future or like the Treehouse of Horror episode where Homer keeps going back in time and is trying not to change anything and he keeps changing things. Don't panic. Remember the advice your father gave you on your wedding day. If you ever travel back in time, don't step on anything because even the tiniest change can alter the future in ways you can't imagine. Like to me, that all comes from City on the Edge of Forever. This idea that if you mess up the past, everything could be different. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay, so here we are. We, we've said in, in, in no uncertain terms that this is the greatest Trek episode of them, all, of them all and singing its praises in so many ways, kind of nitpicking little things here or there. So here's my question for you. When McCoy went back in time, why didn't the landing party disappear? So I have always thought, because I've thought about this before, I've always thought that there is a, a, a sphere around this planet where things are not affected. Okay, I agree. But I also think that time travel, you know, we said in, in tomorrow's yesterday, time travel stories, they never, they never make sense. Like they <laughs> always, it's like, why does Michael J. Fox's family slowly disappear on a photograph when, the, when they already changed the fact that his parents never get together? They should all disappear right then. Why is it happening slowly? Well, uh, you I know? Mean, absolutely. I mean, like, like asking you, like, why didn't the landing party disappear? Why were they shielded from the change in time? And, and I always had it sort of in the back of my mind, just like you, that the planet, there's like yeah. some sphere around the planet that I, I feel like the landing party was protected by the ripples in time emanating from the Guardian. And the, and, and the realization goes around that they are stranded down here. And then you have this moment with Nichelle Nichols and she says, Captain, I'm frightened. What do you think of her? delivery of that line. I think she's great. I think she's great. It, you know, as I said before, she is the one I wish had more to do. I always, yeah. I completely yeah. agree with that. I actually think that compared to her shrieking moment in arena, which seemed like it was out of character yeah. for her, the delivery of I'm frightened is right on point because not only is she frightened, she's in shock. Well, and I think she's also great. And we'll get to it at the end of the episode, just in her reaction shots. She's great. Earth's not there, at least not the Earth we know. We're totally alone. And Kirk looks up, and he and the camera moves off him up to the stars, where there is no Enterprise. Okay, now let me let me point something out to you. Most people today, I think, are watching the version of City on the Edge of Forever, where they're used, they're watching the the new visual effects. And this is an episode that I don't think really benefits much from the new effects. I right. think it, it's perfectly fine 
And yeah, it's not a special effect. It's just as good as it is with the old effects. But if you watch the version of City on the Edge of Forever with the old effects, as the camera pans to show the stars, if you're watching that last moment in Act One, in the original version, everyone else listening to this, this, uh, this podcast episode, go back and watch it. When Kirk looks up to the stars, the stars for a split second, like change. Hmm. Like this, there's a star pattern when the camera pans up to the stars. And then right before it fades to black, the star pattern completely shifts. Hmm. And I always thought of that moment as not only did McCoy going back in time alter Earth's future, it altered the galaxy. There was a butterfly effect in motion from McCoy mm. going back in time that didn't just affect Earth. It affected sure. eternity in some ways. Am I reading too far into this? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> but that's it's, but welcome to Enterprise welcome Incidents. Welcome to Enterprise Incidents, <laughs> where we read into everything and dissect it into the ground. But that is what we love about Enterprise Incidents. That is our purpose. Yeah. But I'm telling you, when you get a chance, go back. And, and again, it's in the original version. And you'll notice. And I want you to hit me up. Well, you know what's what's funny is I, I said I normally watch it with the enhanced effects and then go back and look at all the effects. And this time I forgot I didn't do it, so I hadn't gone back and looked at the original effects this time. It's it's so now I definitely will. You know, again, it's probably just some some weird post production glitch or whatever thing. No big deal. They were fading to black anyway at the moment when the star pattern changes. But I always looked at it as a subtle like this is a lot more serious than just what's going on on Earth. So we've reached the end of Act One, and I really want to hear about all the script stuff and all the drama that happened. But I just want to tell you what my note was here, which is that it always surprises me that we go all the way through Act One before we get to the past, because the past feels to me like a feature film. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It feels so rich and complicated that it, it's amazing to me that it's only the last three acts. You it's know? really amazing that we've gotten to the end of Act One and look at everything that has happened. Yeah. The Enterprise is gone. We don't know what's going on on Earth or the rest of the galaxy for that matter. And what you just said, how the last three acts feel cinematic, I want you to remember that because I'm going to come back to that. But for right now, I want to point out, so the original version of Sitting on the Edge of Forever and as it evolved was very, very different from the version that we actually saw. In Harlan Ellison's original outline and his first draft and the revision that he wrote later on, these were the noticeable differences in the, his original version. Starting off, it's not McCoy, but it's another crew member who gets all this into motion. His name is Beckwith. He's a drug dealer and he's a murderer, and he supplies a powerful drug called the Jewels of Sound to another crew member named Lebec. So right here, you have a crew member on the Enterprise who's a drug dealer, and you have another crew member on the Enterprise who is a drug user. After Lebec uses the drug, he threatens to turn Beckwith into Captain Kirk, but Lebec is murdered by this crew member before he can do anything. Beckwith is court-martialed, found guilty, and he is taken to a nearby uninhabited planet where he is going to be executed by a firing squad. Does this sound like Star Trek to you? No, it's, it's so funny. Like I purposely didn't look at any of this. I've read some of things about it years ago, but I wanted to, to get it fresh. This is, it's all wrong. Okay, okay. So you're talking about mur- mur- by execution of a crew member who was a drug dealer and a murderer. I mean, not, not condoning well, drug, you know, murdering, but, but really like you're going to, kill him <laughs> well let's let's just put that aside for the moment let's say let's say that that's okay in star trek which it's not but what to me it's like that is so complicated and so time consuming and most of the drama does not include our main characters absolutely you know so it's like because i'm imagining pages so as a writer you're always particularly if you're writing for television you're always battling against a page count and if you you imagine it's sort of like a minute a page and so a draft of a star trek episode 
you'd want to get it under 52 pages or 51, knowing that things will get cut down a little bit later. And the Star Trek, they're probably asking, like, we want it at 46 pages or something like that. So you're always fighting. So as soon as you told that story, I'm like, that's 18 pages. You know what I mean? Like, I can't get through. I have to introduce these characters. I have to have one betray each other. I have to have a court martial. And then I have to have the sentencing. Like, that's a lot of stuff. So so while they're on the planet, this uninhabited planet where they're going to execute the guy, <laughs> they're they're picking up radiation on their senses, on their tricorders. And they that's when they sort of go over the hill, so to speak, and they discover a time vortex, which is being guarded over by the guardians of forever. They are guarding over a machine that was created by the ancients. Now, in his revision for this uh, screenplay, the one that's dated May 13th, uh, Ellison took out the court martial and Yeoman Rand was added to the screenplay. Yeoman Rand. Hmm. Uh, I want to ask you about her in a moment, uh, along with the security detail. And Kirk asks to see a demonstration of the time vortex. And that's when this guy Beckwith jumps back through and changes history. Now, Stephen Karabatsis, when he became the new story editor after John D. at Black left, he took a pass at the screenplay. So he took out the drug dealing and the drug using crew members. So he got rid of this Beckwith guy and he is the one, Stephen Karabatsis is the one who replaced Beckwith with McCoy. He also added the scene where Sulu is injured on the bridge. Mm. McCoy is called to help him. The Enterprise encounters turbulence. McCoy falls unconscious after hitting his head. Okay. <laughs> Not with the drug, but he's taken to sick bay and injected with an overdose of adrenaline. And that's when he flees to the planet. So then Dorothy Fontana, wow. who took over as story editor after Stephen Carabatsis. So now Dorothy Fontana is doing a rewrite uh, of Gene Kuhn, who did a rewrite, of Stephen Carabatsis, who did a rewrite of Haro and Ellison's story. Dorothy Fontana created Cordrazine, which was what drives McCoy mad. So those are the big differences in the first act. That's It's so crazy. I mean, for, first of all, I, I hope it makes people understand that these things don't arrive fully formed. It actually takes a lot of trial and error to figure out how to tell a story. That's just, that's how it is. And also you have to keep in mind that when it came to Star Trek, which was a show that no one had ever done before, not even close to doing a show like this, you know, the only person who really had the voice of the characters in his head at the time when this story was started, assigned yeah. was Roddenberry. Right. So when, when Harlan Ellison is, is working on the screenplay, working on his story, and you know, he doesn't really know how Kirk and Spock really talk yet, even though he did see where no man has gone before, but that's just one episode. So as the series is going along and as they're finding their way and as like Spock figures out how to do, uh, uh, you know, all his different things with the, the, the mind meld and the, the, the neck pinch and as Leonard Nimoy figures out how to play him, the voices are starting to become more defined. So of course the producers are going to rewrite things in a way where it, it, it makes sense. And it sounds like the characters that we have come to know and love by the end of the first season. So a couple things, just because I think this illustrates good screenwriting structure and how these changes got it to good screenwriting structure. So there's a couple of terms in screenwriting. One is called the inciting incident. And the inciting incident is the moment where th stuff starts to happen. And in general, the basic rule is you want to have that happen as quickly as possible. You don't want people sitting around and talking and for 25 minutes before anything interesting happens. In this case, the inciting incident is McCoy getting hit with the cordrazine. That is the moment that, oh no, something terrible is happening. And they get to that within two minutes of the show. And you think about how long it would have taken to get to that if you had had him go to sick bay and hit his head and then get the overdose. Or you think about the how long it would take him with the, the drug dealer and the court martial. Yeah. We haven't really gotten there. And then that traditional screenplay structure is three-act structure, even though this is a four-act TV show with a teaser, it still applies, which is that at the end of the quote-unquote first act, you need to know what the show is about. And that's what they get to. McCoy has changed time. That is our problem. Our whole universe has ceased to exist. 
that is the problem. And they get to it really, really efficiently. So you think the inciting incident is McCoy falling on the hypo yeah. versus him going back through time. That's the end of, that would be in screenplay structure. That's the end of act one. Gotcha. That's, okay, what I, I that's where completely. I would put it. Captain's log, no start date. For us, time does not exist. What a dramatic introduction to that second act, right? Captain's log, no start date. There is no Starship Enterprise. Like, holy moly. Like, the stakes in this episode yeah. are absolutely off the hook. And they've asked the Guardian to show us Earth's history again, and we hear what they're going to do. Spock and I will go back into time ourselves and attempt to set right whatever it was that McCoy changed. And what we hear is that Spock was recording when McCoy left. So he thinks he knows or can figure out about when McCoy jumped through. I believe I can approximate just when to jump, perhaps within a month of the correct time, a week if we're fortunate. And of course, Kirk says the key thing. Make sure we arrive before McCoy got there. It's vital we stop him before he does whatever it was that changed all history. Scotty tells them that finding McCoy would be a miracle. Who tells Scotty there is no alternative? Spock, isn't it? Spock. Yeah. In the Galileo 7, mm. Spock tells Scotty there are always alternatives. Oh, good catch. Good catch. This is a rare sort of moment of, I wouldn't say defeat, but in this case, there are no alternatives. Scotty, when you think you've waited long enough, each of you will have to try it. Even if you fail, at least you'll be alive in some past world somewhere. And- James Doohan is so good. All his whole line is, Hi. and yet if you watch what you watch, if you watch his face, is he processes that information, understands what it means, and understands why it is necessary and says yes. I love what you just now said about just how he's able to do so much with so little dialogue at this moment. The way he is observing and reacting, because the way he reacts at the end of this episode, the look on his yes, face absolutely. is telling. Well, there's certain, it's funny, there's certain actors, and I know this both from directing and from being an editor, who are what I would call solid. And what I mean by that is you, I could always cut to them because they're always listening, they're always involved, and they're not doing too much. So some actors think that when they're listening, they have to be doing a lot of stuff. It makes it hard for me to cut to them. I could cut to Jimmy doing any time. He's always there. He's always in the scene. It's so clear. Jimmy Doohan, as beloved as he is in Star Trek, in the original series, but at this point, when, when everyone, uh, all the producers, and certainly the people at NBC and Desilu, realize how lucky they were to have yeah. an actor like Jimmy Doohan, I, I don't think that he gets as much recognition as an actor as he deserves. Who's the fourth? If we have our big three, who's fourth? Got to be Scotty. That's what I think, too. Absolutely, Scotty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, without question, it's yeah. Scotty. Like if they were going to add a fourth name to that opening credits, it, it, it would have to be Jimmy Doohan. I mean, there's a big step down from the big three in terms of screen time and dialogue, but yeah, he's, I, I think so too. Good luck, gentlemen. Happiness at least, sir. And we see time is moving by. Now we see a newspaper and Spock is saying, okay, we're almost there. And then he says, now. and they run in slow motion and then jump through the Guardian. And when they jump out on the other side, Steve, they are jumping out onto day one mm. of filming this episode on Desilu's 40 Acres Backlot, where they also shot the episodes Miri and Return of the Archons. Kirk and Spock have now arrived in the year 1930. It is the year of the Great Depression, which is, in Spock's words, quite barbaric. And this moment when Kirk and Spock jump through and they're looking around, and Kirk is like kind of smiling. He's like, well, we're in the past. Yeah. That moment, that image, that frame is actually the cover of photo novel number one, nice. City on the Edge of Forever. Um, the other cool thing is as they go through, the music reaches a crescendo and then it drops out. And so we just have the city sounds, which I think is a great, great choice to transition us into this space. I love the contrast between sort of the sepia toned look of the landscape, of the streets of New York, of the, 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 the ragged clothing that everyone is wearing. And then you see these two people, you know, this guy wearing a gold shirt. He's very, yeah. very, yeah. very kept and clean cut. And, you know, this other guy Bright wearing blue a blue and, shirt. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's such a great contrast, which is one of the reasons why watching Star Trek in high definition, especially the colors just completely pop. By the way, I think well, this is our third time being on this back lot. I think they do a great job dressing it differently each time. I think, I mean, as I got older, I of course noticed that, oh, I think we're just in the same back lot, but, but like, it really does look different from how it looked in Miri or Archons. Uh, completely different from how it looked in Archons, especially. We seem to be costumed a little out of step with the time. I'm afraid I'm going to be difficult to explain in any case, Captain. And this is the beginning of just the joy of all of their dialogue. Everything they say to each other is so much fun. Well, Mr. Spock, if we can't disguise you, we'll find some way of explaining it. That should prove interesting. They are so great. These two guys, these two actors, Shatner and Nimoy, are so absolutely perfect together. The way they bounce off each other, their chemistry together. So as they're walking across the street, they almost get hit by a car, Spock especially. Yeah. And this is kind of a, a moment that I thought about in 1986 when I was watching Star Trek IV. Sure, absolutely. The Voyage Home in San Francisco, and they almost get hit by a car. Hey, why don't you watch where you're going, you dumbass? Well, I'll double dumbass on you. And of course, there is the scene in Piece of the Action when Kirk. Right cannot drive a fliver, otherwise known as a car. I think there is a real connection between City on the Edge of Forever and Star Trek IV. I, I, I think they're just so the same sense of humor, these two guys together playing off each other. There's, it's so much, and it's a time travel story too. And I also think it's important, cars are important and their inability to handle traffic is important to this episode. That's a really good point about Star Trek IV and sitting on the edge of forever, because I always thought of Star Trek IV as the trouble with tribbles of the Star Trek movies, because even people who don't like Star Trek were able to enjoy Star Trek IV. Right. But I think you're right. I think it actually has a lot of uh, throwbacks and callbacks to City as much as it does to Trouble with Tribbles in terms of the humor. So uh, they're walking and then Kirk stops Spock and he sees some clothes on a fire escape. And Spock's reaction is, Theft, Captain? Well, we'll steal from the rich and give back to the poor later. <laughs> and he climbs up the, the balcony and he grabs the clothes and Kirk is feeling real confident at this moment. He says, I think I'm going to like this century. Simple, easier to manage. We're not going to have any difficulty explaining. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's a policeman in front of them. Policeman played by Hal Baylor. So Hal Baylor in the episode, he, you know, he just have a, has a couple lines of dialogue. And he just sounds very gruff and like a policeman. But in the photo novel, <laughs> in the photo novel for this episode, they gave this policeman an Irish accent because I guess there's some reinforced stereotype there that policemen back in that time were Irish. But I just thought it was a little weird that, that the episode, he does not have an Irish accent at all, but in the photo novel, the writers of the photo novel, the producers, starts, you know, it, it just, it's, it's all in word bubbles, like a comic book. Right. They gave him an Irish accent. And he is perfect casting, just the square face, the perfect uniform. He just is the iconic Depression era cop. You're a police officer. I recognize the traditional accoutrements. Um, and Spock, I love that Spock likes messing with Kirk. He was saying you'll have no trouble explaining it. <laughs> It's so great. <laughs> and then we get this watching Kirk try to muddle his way through this. And the key to the comedy, I think, in addition to these two guys are really funny, is the total dead stare of the cop letting Kirk writhe in this. Now, when Kirk has been forced to improvise a humorous situation, he's not very good at it <laughs> because nerds are not good at telling jokes <laughs> because I'm just thinking of. I take the, the greatest exception to that. In, 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 uh, I am a nerd. I can tell a joke. <laughs> in in a piece of the action, when Kirk is trying to uh, come up with the Fizzbin off the top of his head, he's doing a horrible job at it. But it's funny to watch. Yeah. But what makes him funny is just his utter failure at making it happen. I see you've noticed the ears. They're actually easy to explain. Perhaps the unfortunate accident I had as a child. The unfortunate accident he had as a child. He caught his head in a mechanical rice picker. 
which is a joke that came out of the typewriter of Gene Kuhn hmm. and Harlan Ellison supposedly hated that joke. I've always hated that joke. Actually, there's something really weird. It's not. Yes. He says that he's Chinese and yet any, any, there's a mechanical rice picker. It's not that I think it's racist. Exactly. I th- I just always like, it just, I don't know. It, it always rubbed me the wrong well. way. It has not aged well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, go watch the scene, enjoy it. And then rewind it and watch it again and just watch Nimoy. Just just stare at him the whole time. <laughs> everything he does, every look, every tilt of the head, everything he does is hilarious. <laughs> and But none of this story is working on the cop. He tells him to drop the clothes, put the hands on the wall. And Kirk says, Oh, how careless of your wife to let you go out that way. What? And points to a shoulder. <laughs> oh, yes, it's quite untidy here. Let me help you. And we have the FSNP. Again. This is the second time Kirk is, in one episode yep. that Spock has used the famous Spock neck pinch. I wonder if there is an episode where he's used it more than twice. Hmm. Uh, if you're listening, please let us know. Is there an episode where Spock has used the neck pinch more than twice, more than he does in City on the Edge of Forever? And the cop goes down and we are now on the run and we hear a police whistle. We hear dogs barking. And they see some stairs, they run down some stairs, they go into a basement, they put down their clothes, and Kirk turns to Spock and says, You were actually enjoying my predicament back there. At times, you seem quite human. Captain, I hardly believe that insults are within your prerogative as my commanding officer. Sorry. Well, here's what's great about that. And, and this is something we talked about in Errand of Mercy, and I think we talked about it a bit in Devil in the Dark. Spock's having fun. Mm-hmm. He's not really saying that you shouldn't insult me. He's making a joke and Kirk knows he, and, and Kirk said the human thing to poke at him on purpose. And Spock said this back to continue the joke and they are playing with each other. Uh, I, lo- I love that. And I think that's definitely an element of their relationship that was definitely brought to the fore by Gene Kuhn when he came on as, as the showrunner. So now here we are, we're in the basement of the 21st Street Mission. This was on stage 10 and this, this scene was filmed on day three of the filming of sitting on the edge of forever. It's amazing how like they, they shot totally out of order, which is typical. That's normal. And yeah. Normal. That's the job. But it is really, I think one of the unsung talents of an actor to film out of order and keep your performance chronological. That's got to be a lot harder than people give it credit for it. Don't you no, think? It's really, it's, it's really hard. And I've certainly had conversations with actors where they've kind of gone, Okay, hold on. Where where are we? Where am I? Um, one movie I did had scenes where there was the real scene and then there was replays of the scenes in fantasy where the scene went a different way. And so we shot them at the same time because you're on that location. In fact, we, we shot the same shot twice, once with it going one way, once with it going the other way, and then went and shot the next shot with it going the first way and then the second way. And the level of confusion of, for me too, at a certain point of like, okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> In this version, this is what happened. <laughs> you know, in this yeah. version, this is, it's really, really hard. Uh, we do a dissolve and now we are dressed in uh, period clothes and talking about McCoy's arrival. I believe we have about a week before McCoy arrives, but we can't be certain. Arrives where? Honolulu, Boise, San Diego. Why not outer Mongolia for that matter? But the way Spock sort of reasons that they just have to trust the theory that time is fluid like a river with backwash and the same currents that drew them will draw McCoy and everybody to the same place. It's actually a pretty compelling theory that this is all happening as it was actually meant to happen all along. So you remember, remember I, I mentioned, I don't remember what episode the expression hang a lantern on it, which is where you have something that doesn't make any sense. And so you have a character comment on it, not making any sense. And that makes us accept it. That's what this is. Oh, okay. Is that you have to have Kirk say, well, how do we know where he's going to show up? He could show up anywhere. We've said it twice because Scotty said it back in the previous, back at the other time. Finding McCoy will be And now Spock gives an explanation Mm -hmm. and now we go, okay, we're cool with that. Amazing. And this is the other key that I like. Yes, that is true, Captain. We have no hope. And I really like that because it's like, that's our only choice. Our only choice is to believe that there's a chance. And I think that this is all coming from Spock's experience. Literally going to say the same thing. From Galileo 7. Yep. Spock has learned from his mistakes on Tarsus when he 
was not giving hope yeah. to his his crew members and and he was in command. So he has learned from that experience and he sees how important it is to hold on to hope. As illogical as it may seem, it's essential to moving forward with success. And what would really help him move forward with success is a couple of minutes on the ship's computer because then he could get the info out of his tricorder. Couldn't you build some form of computer aid here? In this zinc-plated, vacuum-tubed culture. <laughs> and I, I, love, I love Kirk messing with Spock. Yes, yeah, well, it would pose an extremely complex problem in logic, Mr. Spock. And he gives an eyebrow raise. <laughs> and then Kirk kind of goes down to the stove and opens up. Again, we have beautiful lighting on his face. And Kirk, even with kind of a little look, says, Excuse me. I sometimes expect too much of you. Spock raises his eyebrows. And then at that moment. Who's there? And then after a few seconds, we see who says those words. Now, Steve, we are now at 19 minutes and 20 seconds into the city on the edge of forever. We're, we're almost halfway through this episode, and we are only now getting our very first look at sister Edith Keeler, played by Joan Collins. She doesn't even appear until almost halfway through the second act. We're already halfway through act two, but there is still sufficient time for the rest of this episode to get to know her and really believe who she is and that she and Kirk are about to embark on this incredible romance in which they are truly soulmates and we believe all of it and, and she's only now appearing for the very first time. So Joan Collins, who was coaxed into doing this episode of Star Trek by her four-year-old daughter at the time named Tara, mm. who encouraged her, you've got to do Star Trek. Joan Collins is an Emmy nominee for Best Actress in a Drama Series for her iconic role as Alexis Colby on the long-running 80s TV series Dynasty. She was also in movies like I Believe in You, The Virgin Queen, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, The Opposite Sex, and The Wayward Bus. But it was those 195 episodes of Dynasty that made her a household name. And what I love about this scene is the soft lighting on Joan Collins, the soft lighting from Finnerman. And it is, okay, her name, Edith Keeler. What do you, have you thought about that name, Keeler? Like uh, what uh, that represents? I have not. Okay. Keeler. Like well, the keel of a ship or? Well, originally in Ellison's earlier outlines, the name was Edith Kostler, but then it was changed to Keeler. So Keeler kind of sounds like a cross between healer and killer. Oh, Think about interesting. It. So, wow. So, like, she is a healer in the sense that she is eventually goes about trying to bring peace, but she is a killer in the extent, in the sense that she's going to be killed to heal the future. There is so much in that name. Well, and that she is going to cause millions of deaths. Even trying to be a healer is going to result in exactly. A whole bunch of deaths. So she's a killer sure. in that respect. But there is there is a lot to read into. Uh, maybe we are reading into it because again, that's what we do here on Enterprise Incidents. But I think the name is more than just a really nice sounding coincidence. Um, two other things about Joan Collins. The first is that her sister is Jackie Collins, the novelist. Oh, sure, yeah. And the other one is, and I just have to say that as a young guy growing up in the you know late seventies, early eighties, and having a subscription to Showtime, Joan Collins was in some racy movies. Oh, Showtime! Uh, uh, are we talking about uh, sort of? Uh soft uh, adult yeah. kind of movies they, they were more adult than i think my parents knew that i was staying up to watch at 11 o'clock at night on <laughs> showtime i didn't even know that <laughs> oh yeah yeah joan collins had some some night pre-dynasty i think very interesting and i think this interaction you know introducing a new character is always really important and her introduction is so strong excuse us miss we didn't mean to trespass it's cold outside a lie is a very poor way to say hello it isn't that cold 
just with that first real true line, we are establishing her character. Mm -hmm. A lie is a poor way to say hello. So she is a noble person. We are establishing that right away. And with that moment, Kirk really looks at her, like really looks into her and sees that she is, well, wait a minute. She is someone special. So he's already picking up on her strength. And at that moment, the score kicks in. Now, the music that is playing under the scene was originally composed by Joseph Mullendore for the conscience of the king, for the scenes when Kirk is trying to romance Lenore Caridian. But just like in Shoreleaf, where Root's theme became better known as Layla Colomi's theme in This Side of Paradise, this cue, this music cue right here, became better known as Edith's mm. theme because it's playing under these moments between Edith and Kirk. I want to say one more thing about the, the, her first line. I totally agree with you that she is honorable and strong. Those are absolutely things we get. It also demonstrates her penetrating her intelligence is that she sees through Kirk instantly because this is something we're going to see from her. She has an intelligence that is almost beyond an intuition and ability to see the truth that is beyond normal. That's the first thing. And the other thing is it's aggressive. Like how often on your second moment, and this is a woman alone with two strange men who have broken into her place and she goes and calls them on the lie. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of strength. She and that's shows. a lot of establishment right there. Like that's just great writing that you're able to establish all these signature moments about her character that are solidified and supported for the rest of the episode right there at this moment. And Kirk reads it correctly too, because he goes, okay. And he comes back almost aggressively, forcefully with the truth. We were being chased by a policeman. Why? These clothes. We stole them. And I think his forceful honesty and her looking at him makes her understand something about Kirk and changes what she would, I think she would have kicked him out or called the cops, but that's not what she does now. Well, when she says, what are your names? Mine's Jim Kirk. His is... Like he was about to lie. Spock. Like he was about to make something up, but he says, well, not going to lie to her. She just called me out on it. I'm going to tell her the truth. It's funny. I never interpreted it that way, but I like your interpretation better. How did you interpret it? I interpreted it that he was trying to come up with another name, like he was trying to come up with the rice picker, automatic rice picker story. And he couldn't come up with anything and just went, Spock. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I've looked at it as like, well. But no, your way's better. She, she literally just called him out on lying, so he ain't going to lie again. Well, um, I could do with some help around here. Uh, doing dishes, sweeping, general cleaning. At what rate of payment? And there's a great look from Kirk. Like, are you like, kidding dude, me? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but he needs money for radio tubes and so forth. His hobby. Well, you can start by cleaning up down here. Excuse me, miss. Where are we? We're in the 21st Street Mission. And I think he was asking a much bigger question about yeah. where are we? Yeah, like, when are we? <laughs> like, what city? What's going on? Do you run this place? Indeed I do, Mr. Kirk. Indeed I do, Mr. Kirk. Which I think also, this is 1930, a woman alone in a rough neighborhood dealing with a lot of poverty. It doesn't seem like she has any other help. This is an impressive person. Absolutely. Very impressive person. Impressive is a word and a half for a captain. Yeah. It's later on in the mission and Spock and Kirk line up. They get some food. They sit down next to a older guy to eat. Okay. That's John Harmon, who plays character identified as Rodent. Rodent. <laughs> Rodent. That's okay. the character's name, or at least in the credits. Uh, but John Harmon would later appear as one of the gangsters in a piece of the action. Right. Uh, so he, he definitely looked familiar. You expect to eat for free or something? You got to listen to Goody Two Shoes. So Joan Collins walks up into a podium. She's about to make a speech. And he says, Not that she's a bad looking broad, but uh, she really wanted to help out a fellow in need. Shut up. He was about to make a sexist comment. Lewd, yes. A very lewd, yeah. sexist comment. And I love Kirk. He's like, shut up. And he was going to continue. And he goes, shut up. And then Spock looks at him and Kirk says, I want to hear what she has to say. Yes, of course, Captain. 
And the thing is, again, watch Nimoy because Nimoy already knows that Kirk is attracted to her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Nimoy is already seeing trouble there. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's more than just that he sees that Kirk is attracted to her. Yeah. He's like, Jim, we're not even yeah. supposed to be here. Yeah, like, <laughs> like we, we already had our entire timeline change because of something McCoy did. Romancing this girl is not necessarily the right choice. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then she gets up and makes a speech. Now, let's start by getting one thing straight. I'm not a do-gooder. If you're a bum, if you can't break off with a booze or whatever it is that makes you a bad risk, then get out. I love the dialogue, and I think, she, I think she delivers this really, really well. Now, I don't pretend to tell you how to find happiness in love when every day is just a struggle to survive. But I do insist that you do survive because the days and the years ahead are worth living for. And then you see a change come over her face, and it's almost like she's a seer. You know what I mean? It's almost like she's a prophet, and she says... One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom. And you see a reaction from Kirk and from Spock. Energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in, in some sort of spaceship. You really want her to say starship. <laughs> and the men that reach out into space will be able to find ways to feed the hungry millions of the world and to cure their diseases. And again, Kirk and Spock kind of amazed listening to this. Gee, now Steve, guess who wrote that speech? Um, Gene Roddenberry. That is correct. That is I'm absolutely glad Roddenberry. I got that one right. That is absolutely what he, what he felt Star Trek was always all about, the hope and optimism for a better future. And she's saying it. She is his voice right there. They will be able to find a way to give each man hope and a common future and those are the days worth living for now more than any other person other any other woman that kirk has met on his travels up to this point edith is in a class all by herself oh, because yeah. edith is speaking his language the strength the optimism what she is calling for is the future that he lives in they are their each other's match so let me ask you a question with where things are going, with the way that Kirk becomes like basically instantly attracted to Edith Cure, how do you think this episode would have played out if Yeoman Janice Rand was still an active crew member on the Enterprise? It would have been terrible, I think. And the, and the reason is, is that the way things were with Rand and the way we left it, there's no question that Kirk is attracted to her. That's obvious. She's a beautiful woman. He notices her. He says to Spock, you're allowed to notice her. I'm not. Like that attraction is there. If we had continued for another dozen episodes before getting to this point, you couldn't have gotten away from Kirk being in love with her. You couldn't have. If you think of all the unrequited love stories in all of television, Sam and Diane or whatever, you know, like all of them, it, it has to mean that they love each other. And if he had been in love with Rand, it would have ruined this episode. I think it would have also ruined elements of both characters. Yeah. Because you would have obviously had other moments where you would have furthered the development of the relationship between Kirk and Ran, only for Kirk to betray her now by falling in love with Eve Keeler. So there would have been a very, I would say, unlikable aspect of his character yeah. at that moment. Also, it would have made Rand a little bit of an unsympathetic character that she's just going to let this happen, that she's not going to sort of take a stand. Who knows what they would have done with the character, how she would have reacted. Maybe she would have just been irritated and that could have been the end of it because of the way that the character was written. But I agree that it was better that as much as I love Grace Lee Whitney and I, I loved what they were doing with that character and that she had some really great moments with Charlie and Amiri. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like her not being a part of the show anymore uh, allowed Kirk to grow in much, much bigger ways. I won. It's a slight criticism of, of I, here's what I wish. So her first speech, her first sort of prophetic speech is about kind of science and space travel. And I totally get why this has an impact on Kirk and Spock. I wish her first speech had been on peace and the peace movement, the pacifist movement, because I don't know why she's telling these people about, you know, the atom and stuff that doesn't seem as useful. And it's also, this is weirder than being a pacifist. I wish this, I wish she was talking about this when she's out on a date with Kirk rather than, so you swip, you switch them a little bit. 
So, so I, I actually, that's a really good point because if she would have gotten up there and talked about the need for peace, right? That would have been something and feeding that the hungry, and you know, everyone in the room would have they would have had a point of connection, right, with that speech. But her talking about spaceships going to the moon, splitting the atom, they're probably thinking like, well, that's this weird. Woman's out of her mind, yeah, right, for well, sure. And we know she becomes a famous pacifist. It's not that she becomes a famous predictor of technology in the future. I think it would be more. It would have been more interesting if she was just talking to Kirk when she said this stuff, and he's like. Wow. Like, how do you, that's amazing. Um, but again, it's an amazing episode of television. Development of atomic power is years away. Space flight years after that. Now it Speculation. Tomorrow, Gifted insight. But it will come. I find her most uncommon, Mr. Spock. And again, Spock gives that look. Mm, yeah. You know, he's like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> um, it's the end of the meal. They're returning plates. They start to walk away and she calls after them. Mr. Kirk. You are uncommon workmen. That basement looks like it's been scrubbed and polished. I love that here are Kirk and Spock in the past doing this menial job and they're, they're doing it the best they possibly can. Absolutely. They're going to do a job. They're going to do it to the best of their abilities, yep. no matter what it is. Well, they're in the military. I mean, frankly, like they, whatever version of polishing your shoes and making everything, you know, spit and polish, they had to go through that at the academy. That is how you do stuff. I want to point out that we have two scenes. One scene ends with Kirk calling her uncommon. This scene begins with her calling them uncommon. Ooh, good catch. Back to back, the same word to describe each uncommon. other. Uncommon. Again, perfect matches. Do you have a flop for the night? What? <laughs> you really are new at this, aren't you? A flop is a place to sleep. And the connection between them is just so, palpable. It's so great. The chemistry is fantastic. Again, here is a character, Edith Keeler, who showed up so late into this episode, but their connection, their dynamic, their chemistry, it is all organic and natural and it works and we believe it. We're in. You could add all these different adjectives and justify this, that, or whatever with the screenplay or when this person shows up or how great the writing is. But the bottom line, Steve, is that there is a magic to the city on the edge of forever. And that magic, the magical element is because of William Shatner and Joan Collins. You know, it just occurred to me, we've seen Kirk attracted to a, a fair number of women in the course of, <laughs> yeah. of season one. He, I think, has always had the power and was always in control of the situations. So with Rand, he's the captain. He's res he's attracted to her, certainly, but he's also resisting and in control. And then we have um, Lenore, Lenore, where he he probably is attracted to her, but he's also using her. Right. Mm -hmm. We That's have right. Uh, the lawyer, uh, Ariel, uh, Ariel Shaw, Ariel Shaw. Well, she's really into him and he's attracted to her. But now we have a situation where he is not in the power position. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, I see he, what you're saying. He, he is feeling things for her that we have never seen. Well, he's out of his element because yeah. he's not in his time. He's not on the bridge of the Enterprise. He's sweeping floors at a mission in 1930s New York City. And he is smitten, smitten with this woman who is uh, not where she belongs because of how forward thinking she is. But you're right. He, it, the fact that he is smitten with her and that he's not in control shows how head over heels in love with her he really is. You know what part of it is? There are a lot of impressive women that he's met. None of them have been as impressive as Captain Kirk. You know, and I don't mean that to say sexist things or negative things about these characters, but Captain Kirk is Captain Kirk. This is a person who is his match or more. You know, you know? the only other time I mm -hmm. felt like Kirk met his match. And this was with a woman that they did not have a romantic relationship, but there was certainly a chemistry and an attraction there. Catherine Hicks hmm. from Star Trek IV, the Cetacean Institute, their, their chemistry is great. They never cross the line, but there's, there is great chemistry. There is a great volley. And she too has the same kind of forward-thinking optimism mm -hmm. for life in general, not human life, but all life the life of the humpback whales, George and Gracie, that Edith has. I think that if you put Edith Keeler and Jillian and Kirk in the same room together, they would have a great conversation. And I also think it's really, really, really good that they did not have a romantic relationship in Star Trek IV. I'm really glad they didn't. I'm glad they didn't go there. Yeah. Right. I mean, it sort of, sort of ends where you know, he goes to kiss her and she like, kisses him on the cheek and he says, see you around the galaxy. 
<laughs> um, and Kirk turns to Spock and says, we have a flop. We have a what, Captain? A place to sleep. One might have said so in the first place. And there's a great little look from Kirk. And then there is a fantastic extra with a big beard playing with his beard as he walks between them. <laughs> you pay extra for that extra. And Spock is now working on some kind of his radio hobby. Uh, and I'm going like, man, that seems like a lot more money than you could get paying 15 cents, getting paid 15 cents an hour and having a two dollar flop to live in. But it's OK. He's working on it. The door starts to open. He reaches for his hat, but it's Kirk with grocery bags. And Spock wants some platinum. The look on Kirk's face. <laughs> so we have seen the two of them sort of like play with each other a little bit. They're kind of irritated with each other. They're having fun with each other. They're not acting like colleagues. They're not acting like uh, officers in the military. They're not acting like a captain and his first officer. They're acting like roommates. It's it's a marriage. I mean, like that. Yeah, they're it roommate. is totally a marriage. You know, <laughs> they bicker. They like each other. They're you know they're irritated with each other. And, and I love Spock has this whole speech about why he needs five to six pounds of platinum. And Kirk says, uh, "Mr. Spock, I've brought you some assorted vegetables." Another hint that he's a vegetarian. We've had a few of those. Bologna and a hard roll for myself. And I've spent the other nine tenths of our combined salaries for the last three days on filling this order for you. Mr. Spock, this bag does not contain platinum, silver, or gold, nor is it likely to in the near future. And Spock is irritated now, too. Captain, you're asking me to work with equipment which is hardly very far ahead of stone knives and bearskins. Listen, Spock has his needs. Kirk understands them. Spock understands that Kirk understands yeah. his needs, but he's still, like, saying, like, you know, I, I need your help here. I, I need what I need in order to get the answers that we need. I believe that the right to bitch about stuff, while it isn't in the Constitution of the United States, it sometimes should be. It is OK. You, you've been on projects and work jobs where, like, at the end of the day, you went out with your fellow coworkers and had a beer and bitched about your boss. And that is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And Spock needs to do that. And Kirk needs to say we still have to get this job done, you yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> McCoy will be along in a few days, perhaps soon. There's no guarantee that these currents in time will bring us together. This has to work. And just as Spock is starting to explain something, there's a knock and Edith enters. Spock grabs his hat and she, it sounds like she has another job for them and then looks past them and sees the crazy equipment that Spock is building. What, what on earth is that? And Spock's line is just the best. I am endeavoring, ma'am, to construct a mnemonic memory circuit using stone knives and bearskins. See, now they were, Kirk and Spock went back to the 21st century and they were building a device like this. She would think that they're terrorists. <laughs> that is a good point. That is a good point. Well, and, and I love too that there's no problem revealing this thing in mnemonic memory device because she has no idea what she that is. She has no idea. She, he's telling her the truth. And, <laughs> and Joan Collins's reaction shot to this going just kind of, hmm, is so funny <laughs> and fun. And we're, it's later on, we're in the mission and we notice some guy working with some fine tools on some equipment. Tools for finely detailed work. So he uses a combination lock, listens with his finely tuned yes. hearing, and opens the lock, and Edith is irritated at both of them for stealing the tools. That toolbox was locked with a combination lock, and you opened it like a real pro. How does she know that he stole the tools? That's a great question. I think, because it is not just that she knows that they stole the tools, she knows that Spock stole the tools. And I think this goes to, her, she is this incredibly insightful person. Like, we could say this is weak screenwriting, but I actually think, no, she sees through everybody. Why did you do it? And Spock honestly says, I needed the fine tools for my radio work. They'd have been returned in the morning. And she says, I'm sorry, I can't. And I believe what she is about to say is, I can't have you working here anymore. I can't trust you. You have to go away. I uh, see. I thought she was going to say, I can't believe that. I don't it, trust you. And, and of course, we can't know. And then Kirk, in, the, in that direct, confident way that she likes, he says, If Mr. Spark says that he needs the tools and that they'd be returned tomorrow morning, you can bet your reputation on that, Miss Keeler. Right, he pauses. The way he pauses, the look that he gives her with that smile. He's so charming in this scene. 
and she says, On one condition. Walk me home. Which is A, very forward for 1930. B, you would think, okay, here are guys that broke into her establishment, have already stolen some stuff. And yet, I again, we could say this is a knock on the screenplay, but I think it's the opposite. I think they continue to establish her character that she sees through people. When Kirk says that, you could bet your reputation. She looks at him. She is 100% certain she knows he's telling the truth and that she knows not just that, but who this guy is. And she says, I still have questions about two of you. Oh, and don't give me that. Questions about little old us, look. You know as well as I do how out of place you two are around here. Interesting. Where would you estimate we belong, Miss Keeler? Two things I want to say about this moment. We're now at 27 minutes and 45 seconds into the episode. And this is when the newly composed partial score composed mm. by Fred Steiner kicks in. Mm. This is now new music for this episode. Up to this point, it had all been tracked from music that was composed by other episodes. But this is brand new music composed by Fred Steiner. And it has uh, an old school feel mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like Star Trek music. It sounds like cinematic 1930s a, movie music. That's a great That's point. going along with what you said about how the, the second, third, and fourth act feel like a movie. They really do. And this line, I, it hit me really hard in a moving way. The next thing she says. So Spock asks, where do we belong? And she says, You? At his side. As if you've always been there and always will. What does that sound like to you? I don't know. I don't know. I have been and oh. I shall be. Wow, you're right. Your friend. The ship is yours. Spock is taking an unforgettable line said by the love of Kirk's life that Kirk had to let die. It's almost like he's saying, Remember how Edith described us? She was right. I have been and always shall be yours. Maybe that's why it hit me so hard because I, it was like the first time anyone had voiced their relationship. And she is right on point. Oh, yeah. She reads them to the T. She reads them perfectly. What's so profound about it is I don't think they've said this to each other. I don't think they've voiced it. They know it, but they haven't consciously thought it. And I think we go to, when I feel friendship for you, I feel ashamed. Because Spock knew then that he's supposed to be by Kirk's side. And now this person, the stranger that they just met, articulates it, the truth about their relationship. And then she turns to Kirk. And you, you belong in another place. I don't know where or how. I'll figure it out eventually. Do you think if Edith Keeler hadn't died, that she would, without Kirk telling her, figure out that they're from the future and he's a spaceship captain? For someone who is so clairvoyant and optimistic with her vision of the future, I think she would have put the pieces together. I she had too. more time, you know, based on their interactions, on the conversations that they have, with the fact that she sees what Spock is building in their room, she would have put it together. I do. I absolutely yeah. think she would have figured it out. I think we've seen her superpower, which is incredible insight into people. Mm-hmm. Because, sure. and the next moment is perfect example. Spock says, I'm finished with the furnace. Captain, even when he doesn't say it, he does. She just has Kirk eating out of her hands at this point. He is fallen and he can't get up. <laughs> and, and we're left with Spock who watches him go and knows. Spock just knows this, is, this just yeah. keeps getting worse. They're out, he's walking with her. And I love that we start with a shot of him taking her hand. And the reason I love that is normally that would be later on in the scene. We talk for a while, things are comfortable, they laugh, we see the connection, and then they take hands. The fact that it happens at this moment, where she just called them out for stealing, is saying that she and Kirk both acknowledge the connection they have. They know, they both know, yes, this is what's going on. The song that's playing during their stroll is Goodnight Sweetheart, sung by Ray Noble. Thing is, the song came out in 1931, which is actually the year after mm. Sitting on the Edge of Forever takes place. But the barbershop that Kirk and Edith are strolling in front of 
was actually Floyd's I Barbershop. I was ask that. <laughs> yes, it's Floyd's Barbershop from the Andy Griffith Show. But this moment between Shatner and Joan Collins is just gold. It's just gold. And she's asking questions about did they serve in the war together? And Kirk is being somewhat cagey in his answers. We serve together. And you um, don't want to talk about it? Why? Or did you did you do something wrong? Are you afraid of something? Whatever it is, let me help. And just Kirk just takes that and says, you know, a couple hundred years from now, you know, those words are going to be chosen even over "I love you" as a great poem uh, written by someone on another planet. Who who is he? Where does he come from? Um, where will he come from? Silly question. Want to hear a silly answer? Yes. A planet. Circling that far left star in Orion's belt. See? And they look up and they both look at the stars in the same way. And then they look at each other to, to see that this love is flourishing in, in the course. Of, by the way, we're still in the second act Well, when Edith was introduced. Well, and if you look at the shot where they look at each other, just before we cut away to the Brooklyn Bridge and some stock footage, they're just almost leaning in. It's right at the beginning of the motion. It's a strange place to cut. Normally you wouldn't cut right at the beginning of a motion like that, but it, what it tells us is they were probably about to kiss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can't know for certain. I want to go back to this novel where this writer chose, let me help over, I love you. I think that's James T. Kirk's favorite novel. Do you want to know why I think that? Because he's a nerd. No, <laughs> not because he's a nerd. <laughs> What is the basic sacrifice Kirk has made in his entire life? He has chosen duty over love. Excellent. That is what he has chosen. Every, yep. Whether it's Carol Marcus, whether it's Ruth, whether it's Yeoman Rand, at every single step he has said, he has chosen, let me help over, I love you. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. They are the words that, that and it's one of the many, many books that he has read and memorized. Absolutely. Spock is working at his device, and the first thing we see is a newspaper article that says social worker killed, and there's a picture of Edith Keeler. And then his system goes out, and he's working on it, and Kirk comes in, having just had an amazing date, and he's asks- He's in a great mood. Yeah, great mood. How are the stone knives and bearskins? I may have found our focal point in time. I think you may also find you have a Connection burning someplace. Because Spock is pushing his system too hard. I believe we'll have our answer on this screen, Captain. Good. And, Captain, you may find this a bit distressing. Right, let's see what you have. Spock's trying to soften the blow because he thinks he knows what's coming. And I think we think we're going to see that Edith Killer's going to die in a traffic accident. But that's not what we see. What we see is a picture of Edith Keeler, and the article says FDR confirms with slum area angel. The president and Edith Keeler conferred for some time today. And he starts to read the article, and the circuit's overloaded. They burn out. The screen goes away. Now, Kirk is excited, mm -hmm. almost empowered by who this woman is and what she will eventually become. We know her future. Within six years from now, she'll become very important, nationally famous. Or, Captain, Edith Keeler will die this year. I saw her obituary. This is the moment of truth. Mm -hmm. This is the focal point of the time disturbance that has drawn them together and will eventually draw McCoy to this point. She is the moment that will determine the future. She, this one person, will affect everything if she lives or dies. But her death is inconceivable to Kirk because of just who she is, what she represents, and the fact that he has fallen hard for her. You see, I think two really interesting things happen. One is you see Spock really trying to soften this blow, really being gentle with his friend, because he knows how he feels about her. And then you see Kirk reckoning with the dawning realization of what this means. She has two possible futures then. And depending on whether she lives or dies, all of history will be changed. And McCoy, is the random element. And then Kirk asks the question. In his condition, what does he do? Does he kill her? 
Or perhaps he prevents her from being killed. We don't know which. And Kirk says, Get this thing fixed. We must find out before McCoy arrives. And then Spock says, Suppose we discover that in order to set things straight again, Edith Keeler must die. And Kirk is like frozen at the door. And that is the end of Act Two. And I really want to hear about what happened to get us to this point. But I just want to point out one thing. Act Two started at t- just around 12 minutes into the show. It is now 33 minutes and 40 seconds. That's almost a 22 minute long act. That's a, that's a long second act. That's half the show, yeah. basically. Yeah, almost wow. half the show. That's a really good yeah, point. Yeah, it's a long act. There are other changes that were made in Act Two from the original versions and the evolved versions before they got us to this point that we have seen for the last 55 years. In Ellison's original version, and this is a big difference, after Beckwith- Bigger than the drug dealers and the- (laughs) Well, yeah. Okay, so check this out. So after this guy Beckwith goes back in time and changes the past, the landing party beams up to the Enterprise, and they find that it is now a renegade ship manned by pirates, and it is not called the Enterprise, it's called the Condor, but renegade ship manned by pirates. Sound familiar? Yeah, mirror, mirror. Mirror, mirror. Now, whether or not they use that element that Jerome Bixby, who wrote Mirror, Mirror, knew about these early developments, early outlines and teleplays written by Ellison and said, hey, that would make a great episode in its own right. But the other big difference Kirk and Spock being back down, they jump through the vortex to stop Beckwith from saving Edith Kostler, as her name was at that point, from a traffic accident. So at this point- Do they know that that's what they're going to do? Yes. That's the Ahead of time. Yeah. Ahead of time. Before they even go back in time, they know that this Edith Kostler has to die. So before Kirk can even meet her and fall in love with her, he knows what her fate is going to be. Obviously, it's much better- the other way, yeah. when he falls in love with her first and then finds out that she's going to die. And the city that they travel back to was not New York. The city that they travel back to is Chicago. Mm. So when Gene Kuhn did his version of it, he eliminated the renegade version of the Enterprise they beam back to. And Gene Kuhn definitely added a welcome dose of humor, which mm. is the rice picker scene. But it was Gene Roddenberry, as I mentioned, you know, he was the one who came up with Edith's speech about going to the stars, splitting the atom. That, that inspirational, aspirational speech has Roddenberry's name, his, his fingerprints all over. You know, there's the line in Amadeus where the emperor says, too many notes. There's definitely too many notes in Harlan's skirts. Like, wait, you're going to introduce a pirate ship? Like, what? <laughs> like there's so much stuff. And, and time is a zero-sum game. So any time you give to your pirate ship is time you take away from Edith Kostler or whatever the name is. And a, a classic structure of you don't want to find out you have to let the person die before you fall in love with them. You find out after. Exactly. That, that is Absolutely. Just, yeah. That's a big thing. I mean, you know. Uh, um, it makes so much, it's so much more impactful that he falls in love with her first and then finds out that she's going to die. Well, it's so funny because I didn't know all the details. I knew there was controversy about this thing, obviously, because it's part of Star Trek lore. And I think I gave Harlan Ellison way more credit than I'm giving him now because you can't argue with the greatest Star Trek episode of all time. You know, it's like, no, your choices were wrong. These choices are better. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. it's act three. It's morning. We see the milk truck going by, and there is our old guy, Rodent. And after the milk truck is gone, he goes down the alley and steals that big glass bottle of milk. It's funny, I'm watching with my wife, and she said, oh, he's going to drop that. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. And then McCoy comes through the portal. Assassins! My arrest! Okay, this always gave me the chills, because where he jumps through is where Kirk and Spock were. Mm. So he jumps from a point in time where Kirk and Spock are to another point in time where Kirk and Spock are. You know what I mean? Like when you wrap your head around time travel. Which you can't. (laughs) Which you can't because it's just, it's so mind boggling. Like look at Planet of the Apes, you know, that the apes use his spaceship to go back to the past to create the Planet of the Apes. You know what I mean? And then here you have- Uh, In this episode that, you know, McCoy is jumping through the portal, leaving Kirk and Spock behind 
only to arrive at another time where Kirk and Spock are waiting for them. Uh, time travel is just such a mind, mind, you know, yeah. mind deaf. Well, well, the thing, I mean, it is particularly because Planet of the Apes, not the first movie, but then in the series of movies goes through this circular thing where this is how it has to happen, that the cause is the effect which causes itself to happen to cause itself. Exactly. You know, and that's just, I mean, what's interesting, the first one is just relativistic speeds make him later in time. He's not time traveling like going back in time. It's just he ends up as a planet years and years later. So it doesn't have the paradoxes that we have in later movies. Um, anyway, McCoy still crazed, but maybe slightly less because he yells at the guy who drops the milk, as my wife predicted, and he sees him maybe as an ally. No! Don't run! I won't kill you! It's they who do the killing! And we cut from there to Kirk and Edith. I think that one day they're going to take all the money that they spend now on war and death. And make them spend it on life. Yes. You see the same things that I do. We speak the same language. The very same. And he leans in to kiss her. And again, we don't see the kiss happen. We never actually see Kirk right. and Edith kiss. But, see now, this scene actually ran much longer mm. than the version that we see in this episode. And the proof of that lies on a release from 2016 called The Roddenberry Vault. Hmm. This was a series of documentaries that came out in 2016 that were culled together from deleted scenes, extended scenes, scenes from the original series that did not make it into the episode that ended up on the cutting room floor. And for the longest time, I never even knew that these scenes existed. I just thought that they didn't know what they had. They threw all that stuff out. Mm. And the only moving images we had of the original series was the series itself. But these, ser these deleted scenes were saved. So I was actually honored and fortunate to be interviewed for this documentary mm -hmm. series on the deleted scenes. And when I saw these scenes for the first time, the first of these deleted scenes that I ever saw was the extended scene, this scene between Kirk and Edith when mm. they do kiss mm. and the dialogue between them is, keeps going. And Edith actually uses the word forever in the dialogue. Oh, interesting. This deleted scene, this extended scene from the city on the edge of forever is the holy grail of deleted <laughs> scenes from the original series. Because, first of all, the quality of the deleted scene is still amazing. Like, right. it, like even though it's been sitting around for all this time, uh, it still looks pretty good. The sound is still looks good. The, the video quality, the, the film quality, the film stock still looks very, very good. But what a shame that this full scene did not make it into the episode because they actually use the word from the title of the episode in the dialogue. It would have made the scene resonate so much deeper in an episode that already resonates very, very deep. But if you, if you, you absolutely have to check out this. I will. It's called The Roddenberry Vault, and it's a deleted scene from Sitting on the Edge of Forever. And among other episodes, they also have Metamorphosis and and uh, the Cobra might maneuver. If you love the original series, you've got to have the Roddenberry Vault. It's amazing. But they actually did kiss. It just didn't make it into the final episode. It's funny. 80% of the time, I'm happy deleted scenes were deleted. They usually, it's very rare that I see something and go, oh, I'm so glad they put I, that back I agree in. with you. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you. But when I saw this scene no, it sounds extended, really cool. I just said that should have been in there. D. Kelly's performance in this episode and the range that he shows is amazing. And this, agree. and this scene with this guy. I'm glad you got away too. Yeah, I, I, why do you think they want to kill us? Well, the thing is, like, McCoy jumps through the portal and he's so crazed and out of his mind, he doesn't know where he is. Like, he, he thinks he's on Earth, but he doesn't know. He definitely doesn't know when. He doesn't know the scope of just what what happened that he went through this time portal and now he's back in, in earth in 1930. Where are we? Earth. 
constellation seem right. But- and the, the makeup job yeah. on him is fantastic. And his, you're right, his performance, the range of his performance in this episode is stronger and greater than any other episode or movie, I might add, that the Forrest Kelly ever yeah. was able to do. And this scene alone, the yeah. range in this scene alone is incredible. And I love that he grabs his legs and goes biped. And then when he takes his hat off and starts feeling his yeah. head. Good cranial development. It's, 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 it's so, it's like scary because he's so messed up, but it's also funny at the same time. Good. Modern museum perfection. Right down to the cement beams. And he grabs onto that beam and he starts to go down. Um, and what really starts to wreck him is imagining the hospitals. Probably needles and sutures. All the pity is the head cut and sew people like garments. <laughs> Needles and sutures. And the emotion mixed in with the fact that he's still strung out on the Cortrazine yeah. is too much for him and he passes out. And Rodin searches him, finds the phaser. Uh, my son Jack said, he's going to kill himself, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Good, good clairvoyance yeah. uh, there, Jax. Um, and I love the lighting of the, of the space that he goes into with the phaser before he dies. It's just beautifully lit. And just like that, in a flash of light, Roden disappears. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. What would have happened if maybe Roden didn't point the phaser at himself and he pointed it somewhere else, realizing that this is a very powerful weapon? You would have had another situation where you're altering the future. Yeah. Because we- who knows what he would have done with that? Yep. That the fact that Roden was stupid enough to steal it from McCoy, point it at himself, end his existence right there before he could have done any damage. They got very, very lucky. Yeah. Because clearly he had no effect on the future. Whether he lived or died made no difference at all. How long before we get a full answer? I'll need at least two more days before I dare make another attempt. McCoy could have been in the city a week now, for all we know. And whatever he does that affects her, changes history, could happen tonight, tomorrow morning. Our last bit of information was obtained at the expense of 30 hours work in fused and burned circuits. And this is kind of what the scene's about. And I get this, it's balancing. We need to know this information right now. And if we go too fast, we'll blow out the whole system and we won't get anything. I must know whether she lives or dies, Spock. I must know what to do. So at that point, McCoy is wandering into the 21st Street mission and the kitchen area of the 21st Street mission was not filmed on stage nine, where the Enterprise sets mm-hmm. were, was not filmed on stage 10, mm. where all the exteriors, the planet scenes, other scenes, the mission scene with the kitchen was actually filmed on stage 11 mm. on the Desilu lot, which was a very, very rare case where they actually went off of stage nine and stage 10 and went on to stage 11. That coffee, it just smells wonderful. You look terrible. You better sit down. Come on. I can't. I got to keep moving. I can't let them find me. Oh, there's a cot in the back room. Look, they won't find you there. Come on. And just as Edith takes McCoy away, Spock walks into the kitchen. They just miss each other. The rivers, the currents that are sweeping them together, they're doing what they are supposed to do. And it is only a matter of time before they're all in the same current. I can totally picture also... McCoy's, uh, DeForest Kelly's conversation with Joseph Pevney, where he went, okay, how far gone am I in this scene? And because you could see the step down is that he's still paranoid, but he's no longer crazed. His paranoia is, and he can ask for a cup of coffee. You know, it's like his paranoia is down at a way more reasonable level. And he asks for a cup of coffee. Nicely. Nicely. Yeah. You're right. The drug is starting to wear off. He's still paranoid. He still thinks he's, he's delusional that, that people are after him. But it's starting to wear off. This is how history went after McCoy changed it. And what we see is that there was a pacifist movement that grew in the 30s. And that pacifist movement delayed the U.S.'s entry into World War II long enough for Germany to develop the atomic bomb. This is the first mention of Nazi Germany in Star Trek. Hmm. But it was alluded to in Conscience Conscience of the the King. King when Spock is talking about how Kodos had his own theory of eugenics. And McCoy says, 
unfortunately, he wasn't the first. But this is the, the first direct yeah. mention of Nazi Germany, and it would be far from being the last. And what we hear is that Edith Keeler is the founder of the peace movement, and it's because of her that we didn't enter the war, and because of her that Germany won World War II. But she was right. Peace was the way. She was right, but at the wrong time. So one of the ways we talked about interpreting Star Trek is the older generation, the practical generation that fought World War II, that dealt with the Depression, speaking to the younger, my idealistic generation that believes in the peace movements. And I think we saw a little bit of that in Miri. We saw some of that in this side of paradise. What I think is so interesting, and it's kind of what I thought about when we talked about Errand of Mercy, is they're doing something really delicate here, which is they're not saying they're wrong. They're saying they're wrong right now. And, that, and, and what it is, is it's trying to say, no, we agree with you. Peace is the way. But there are bad guys out there. There's the Soviet Union. There's China. There's Vietnam. There's things happening. And you, and you have to be strong to deal with them, even though we agree with you that you're right. It's not saying a simple, you know, yay, yay, peace is awesome. And it's not saying a simple, you guys are naive and stupid. It's saying a complicated thing. Absolutely. That one line always struck me. She was right, but at the wrong time. Yeah. That is a line that always struck me for everything that you just said so eloquently. And that's because here you were dealing with the Nazis, which was a force that could only be dealt with by fighting back. There was no other way. Peace was not going to work yep. with the Nazis. They had to fight them. I mean, they were also, they were not only were they taking over the world, but they were also, you know, taking out our people, taking away races of people because yeah. they were just races of people, including obviously the Jews uh, with the Holocaust. So no, we, we had to fight them. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is absolutely correct. Peace was the way and she was right, but not now. The problem with the argument is you can always say that, not right. now. You always find a way to justify peace was the way, but not now. Yeah. You're right. There's always a, like you could say that. Right yeah, now. Absolutely. Right. And people could. are saying that right now. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it wasn't the way as in Nazi Germany. And sometimes maybe it was, but we don't know because right. we never did it. You know? <laughs> and Kirk is just with the soft whisper. No. All this because of one thing, like what? An example of the butterfly effect, like a devastating example of the butterfly effect. The one person living would cause so many more people to die and the earth to be changed in such a way that we would never even have a Starship Enterprise. And watching Kirk reckon with this, watching him deal with this. How did she die? What day? You can estimate general happenings from these images. But I can't trace down precise actions at exact moments, Captain. I'm sorry. Spock says to Kirk, I'm sorry. He's actually able to say the mm -hmm. words, I'm sorry. Did he ever say the words, I'm sorry? Ever? Yes. When? He did. When? Uh, I believe in Corbamite. No. Right. Okay. Yes yeah. and no. He's about to say, mm. I'm sorry. But he stops himself. Mm. Because I'm sorry is an expression. A human expression. A human expression. An expression of emotion. Yeah, in Corbin, he says, I regret that right. I'm unable to, something like that. He doesn't say the word sorry. He stops himself. I'm so, I regret that I can find no other logical alternative. He's consciously ascertaining the situation with his Vulcan side. But now, under these circumstances, Spock sees how much in pain his closest friend is he's not his commanding officer right now yeah he's his friend and he's connecting to him on a human level by saying i'm sorry so i want to focus on i'm sorry too and do you remember it's just a few episodes ago that kirk took away spock's love in this side of paradise and i was upset that kirk didn't say i'm sorry and here's what I think. Again, we're making this up. There isn't this kind of continuity in the show. I acknowledge that. But Spock now has the opportunity to be kinder to his friend than his friend was to him. Absolutely. And so he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that he didn't get, because he knows 
how, he doesn't know exactly what this pain is like, but he knows the pain of losing love. And he knows how much he loved Layla. And Spock lost his love in a completely different, different way, way, completely different circumstance. Layla didn't die, but, but the love his died. love for her died because the spores were gone and, and he chose to go back to being- and Because of his duty, because of what he had to be done. But the, what I'll say in Kirk's defense in the side of paradise, he doesn't say I'm sorry, but he does say uh, it hurt me in more, he, in he more said, ways than it, one. Yeah. yeah, more ways than one. Yeah. So that was his uh, absolutely, you know, and that's what Ralph said too. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, levity. Yeah, you know, he you know in his moment yep. of levity, he said, you know, hey, I'm sorry, but he did it in a way where he was trying to make sort of light of it. But you're right, I completely agree that that Spock knows how Kirk feels, and yeah. he's saying. He's like saying, I get it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I feel for you. And then Kirk, in a profound and difficult admission, says what Spock already knew. Spock, I believe I'm in love with Edith Keeler. And Spock's response? Jim, Edith Keeler must die. That is now the second time in two acts where... It ended with Spock basically saying, Edith Keeler must die. It's act four. McCoy is lying in a bed. He's got like a compress on his head. Edith is there. The most common question to ask would be, where am I? I don't think I'll ask it. And that's so quintessential McCoy. Yeah. The levity is there. Mm -hmm. He is completely spent physically and emotionally by his ordeal, by the effect of the cordrazine has worn off and he has come back to his senses. He is Dr. McCoy. Pretty hungover. Yeah. But, hungover. But, that's exactly what but, he is. But he's, he is back. And yeah. I love that he doesn't want to answer, ask that question because the only possible answer would conclusively prove that I'm either unconscious or demented. This looks like old earth around 1920 or 25. Would you care to try for 30? And then she says, and this is the beginning of her insights and her connections. I have a friend that talks about Earth the same way that you do. Would you like to meet him? I'm a surgeon, not a psychiatrist. Which, although technically he is, because in court martial they say, and you are an expert in space psychiatry. Oh, oh good catch! I am Leonard McCoy, senior medical officer aboard the USS Enterprise. And I like she says, and not to dispute you, but that hardly looks like a Navy uniform. And I, I love the gentleness of his line, and it's so quintessentially McCoy. It's quite all right. But all right, dear, because I don't believe in you either. What do you think of that line? I don't believe in you either. Is he saying that? I'm sure this is all just some hallucination, which he does say a little bit later. Well, does he remember that he's done the cordrazine at this moment? I think so. I think he remembers the cordrazine. You think he remembers? He that certainly he does in the next scene. Cordrazine. Well, well, he certainly does in the next scene because yeah. he he brings it up. So no, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I revealed in another episode that I've had certain experiences where maybe figuring out what was real maybe wasn't as easy is this is exactly what you do. You don't say no to the hallucination or what's going on in your brain, but you also don't accept its reality because you know you had been on a drug. And so you go, OK, I, I, I'm just going to I I don't believe in you, but I'm going to be real calm about it <laughs> at this moment because I don't know what's going on. Because how could he figure out? How could he? He did. How could he figure out that he's back in time? He barely keep his eyes open too. Yeah. He's still completely, completely wiped out. <laughs> By the way, so Edith Keeler left, and my wife, who's a little bit OCD, was very upset that she left a drawer open before she left the room. <laughs> <laughs> really, she's like, you can't, you can't leave that drawer open. You have to close that. <laughs> Are you following me, sir? With ulterior motives, does that please you? And at that moment, she's walking down the steps. And she trips and almost falls, and Kirk instinctively grabs her, as any person would. But that moment could have been the moment could have where been the she moment. falls and she kill and she dies, and that problem solved, so to speak. That was Bob Justman, Robert H. Justman, mm. associate producer. It was his idea to have her to have an like, almost have an almost yeah. where Kirk just saves her instinctively and then is called out by the fact that. Spock saw it. You could have just interfered with history right there. Two things about it. One is I've watched a lot of actors try to fake a fall, a trip. It's really, really hard to do because it's hard to 
make yourself consciously trip and then act as if it's unexpected. This one is amazing. She, I really think if Kirk doesn't catch her, she goes down the stairs. If Shatner's not there, she really went for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's actually almost scary. And the other thing is just the pain. Like you watch, cause Kirk knows that could have been that moment mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. watching him walk down the stairs, knowing that, what this means and what he's probably going to have to do is so painful. And when Spock calls him out on it and said that she could have died right there, the way Kirk looks up at him and says, like, like, like his voice is shaking, quivering, like, It's not yet time. McCoy isn't here. We're not that sure of our facts. Who's to say when the exact time will come? Save her. Do as your heart tells you to do. And millions will die who did not die before. Spock is like laying it on foreshadowing what is to come. So way back when we started this thing, I had an epiphany somewhere on after enemy within, I think that this show is frequently about balancing logic with emotion and desire. And that frequently it is the strength of will to overcome your fear in the case of Bailey, to overcome the dark side in the case of the enemy within, to overcome the wave of emotions in the case of the naked time, that is always the logical mind dominating and being able to make the right choice even when emotionally it feels like the wrong choice. This is the ultimate example of it. Absolutely, you're right. And that the idea of you found true love, and if you don't let your true love die, millions of people, the world will be destroyed. So what is it? What are you saying with regards to the enemy within here? Well, in the enemy within, what Spock said is, is your logical mind that's going to keep you together. That the, that the evil side that has all the desire and emotion, that doesn't have the strength to hold you together. The logical mind does. Mm -hmm. That's what helps him to overcome the, the disease in the naked time. That's what helps him overcome in this side of paradise is that his brain has some super strength to hold on to something in spite of desire. And it's the same with, you know, Gary Mitchell can't overcome his desires when his powers become too big. Pike can overcome his desires when he wants to get away from the Telosians. That's what happens over and over again. And now we get the ultimate test. You have found true love something you've never had in your life, something you've denied yourself, no beach to walk on. He made the choice with Carol Marcus. He, I mean, like, but we know it's not here in this timeline. I mean, it's, it hasn't happened yet, but he walked away from his child, his son, because he felt he had a duty. And now he's trapped by one that is too, the love is so strong, the strongest one. And now he's going to have to make the hardest of all of these choices. But he doesn't know when he's going to have to do that. Nope. And now McCoy is up. He's standing up. He's drinking coffee. Well, you look just fine, Doctor. And he's back. I think he's McCoy's back, back yeah, here. Yeah, McCoy is back. And I've convinced myself that this is all in a quadracine hallucination. But I've decided you're not. That's great. Okay. Now, with that, I want to read this quote okay. from DeForest Kelly. During the filming, I became convinced that McCoy should also fall for lovely Edith Cure. Totally. I felt it would add to the intrigue should McCoy as well as Kirk come under the spell of her decency, humanity, and beauty, both inner and outer. I thought a good spot to indicate the attraction was when Edith comes to McCoy's room where he's recuperating. Joseph Pevney shot it. It was never seen. Hmm. But I agree that there are certain people who just have a magic to them. They just cast a spell. There are certain women who just, they're so easy to fall in love with. Edith Keeler is yep. one of those people. And there is a side of her that, that Kirk fell head over heels for. And we see it, even though they didn't film. Yeah, the it's the totally scene. there. Do you see that he is attracted to her? I think McCoy frequently has a sort of, paternal attraction, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know that he is romantically, but it is clear that he is looking at this woman like you are something really special. Absolutely. I have a deep connection to you, mm -hmm. right? Well, and what is McCoy? He's a healer, you know? And so is she. And so is she. And that she, she took him in when, that's what the scene is about, that she saw that he needed her, that he needed a friend. But at this moment, she's about to go see a Clark Gable movie with her man. A who and movie? He doesn't know who Clark Gable is. And you know what? 
No one in 1930 would have known who Clark Gable really is because he was not yet a leading man. Hmm. I mean, you know, Gone with the Wind wasn't until 39. So this is 1930. He was an actor, but he wasn't like, you know, Tom Cruise or somebody like that. Well, it happened when night's 36, I think. It happened when night is, uh, yeah, 30, 35. 35 or 36. Yeah, yeah. He was already a star then, but I don't he, know when but, his first starring roles were. Right. I mean, he was already acting yeah. by 1930, but he wasn't like a household name. It's a good catch. It's a good catch. And now we're in a, a really interesting wide shot with a dark foreground as they cross the street. And what happens? The screech of a car. Because they're again in front of a moving car. And this is the rule of threes. We had it once with Spock. This is the second time. And the third time is the transformation. That's right. Yeah. The screeching car that we see after Kirk and Spock arrive in 1930 was more than just for a moment of levity and humor. Yeah. That was like, hey, you know, people don't know how to drive in 1930. And you better be careful. Oh. Harry, maybe we can catch the Clark Gable movie at the office. What? No, Dr. McCoy said the same McCoy. thing. McCoy! And Shatner's reaction. Leonard McCoy? The expression on Kirk's face and the delivery of Shatner's performance. Like, oh my God, oh my God. In an effort to protect her, mm -hmm. he says, Stay right here. And he screams out, Spock! And he's running back towards the mission. And he turns around to Edith when he's running away and says, Stay right there. He's protecting her. You know what I think's happening? What's happening? I think he still thinks he can get out of it. I think, because what is Kirk? Kirk is the guy that beats the no-win scenario. Kirk is the guy that turns death into a fighting chance for life. I think he's still scheming because that's what he does. Right up into when he says, stay there, he goes, I, maybe I can work this out. Maybe I can do, but there's something I can do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when he gets over to McCoy and he turns around and sees her in the street, he realizes. He says it twice. A, he yeah. says, stay here. And he's running across the street. He's yelling for Spock. He says, stay right there. But to no avail, he goes and his Spock comes out of the mission. McCoy comes out of the mission. They're reunited. What is it? McCoy. He's a oh. And McCoy and Spock are shaking each other's hands. And Edith, well, she's. What is going on here? Like, these guys know each other. I want answers that the strength in her not staying right there like she was told to do. Well, and it's so interesting what she's seeing that she's not looking anywhere else. And as she is walking and the car is coming. And when Kirk turns and sees Edith coming through the street and we do two quick zooms in, one is on Kirk and one is on Edith as they look at each other in the last time they're going to look at each other. Mm -hmm. And yes, that technique is never anywhere else in all of Star Trek. That's it is correct. Entirely unique. And it brings these two characters together in their last moments, the final moments of their love. No, Jim. Kirk stops himself. He sees what's about to happen and he has the strength of will to stop himself, but that's not all he has to do because McCoy sees Edith. And as we've said, he feels love for her too. He sees that she's about to die. He is a healer. He's a lifesaver. And he runs to go save her. And Kirk has to stop McCoy. And he holds McCoy. The car screeches, hits Edith. You hear her scream. And then all of the sound stops. Total silence. And then that searing music cue to indicate tragedy and Kirk is holding onto McCoy for dear life with his eyes squeezed closed like he doesn't want to hear anything he doesn't want to see what just happened he can't even look back on Edith's dead body deliberately stop me Jim I could have saved her just did. And Kirk pushes him away without even looking at him. He knows, Doctor. He knows. And the look on Kirk's face, his fist is clenched and he bites his knuckles. Oh, unbelievable. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I think you all might have already answered this. The moment when Kirk stops himself and then turns around to hold McCoy. Which side of Kirk from the enemy within are we seeing at this moment? The good side. You think it's the good side? Yeah. You think that 
you don't think that the good side would have had enough strength to protect Edith from being killed. I mean, the, the good side of Kirk was the compassionate side. Yes. The, the side of Kirk when they're putting the alien dog on the transporter platform. Yes. And he says, don't hurt him. You don't think that the good Kirk would have run to save Edith? You don't think that it's the darker side of Kirk that had the strength to shield himself and McCoy from saving her? So obviously this is debatable. I think, first of all, the dark side of Kirk is also the side with the stronger desires. So part of the love for Edith is in the dark side. Part of it's in the good side too. The second thing is, what do we hear throughout? Is that the dark side was afraid. The dark side didn't have the strength. The dark side doesn't have the logical mind. The dark side just reacts emotionally. It is the good side that has the strength of the logical mind to do what's right. I think I, I don't think that strength exists in the dark side. That's my opinion. Well, in The Enemy Within, when they were losing the dark her, yeah. when he was, his, his health was failing, and McCoy says to Kirk, you see, he was afraid and you weren't. Yeah. So I agree with you. I think it was the good Kirk that saved the future. I think it was the good side of Kirk that prevented McCoy from saving Edith. But destiny, fate happened. And this was how it was always meant to happen. What took me all these years to finally realize is that Kirk and Spock and McCoy were part of the past all along. They didn't go back in time to correct the past. They went back in time to be a part of it, which was what they were always destined to do. When McCoy originally went back, it was McCoy who changed the future, but it was always part of history that these three figures from the future were in this one little pocket of the past and had an impact on it. They were always there. They were all, it, was, it was always a part of history. They didn't go back and change or correct anything. They were a part of it from the beginning. So I'm going to spend as little time as possible discussing this because you could go endlessly onto time travel. But this is A, why Star Trek time travel rules are among the worst. Because they just, <laughs> the number of, you know, it's like, because then we have, well, but now you're creating different timelines. And now you're, you know, and, but the, that connects to Star Trek Four and Scotty saying, how did you know he didn't invent the thing? Because that is, that is the destiny philosophy. We were meant to go back and make these changes. Kirk and Spock jump through the portal. What happened, sir? You only left a moment ago. That's because if Kirk and Spock were not successful, there would have been no future to go back to. Right. They would have been stuck in the past. If they were not successful, there would have been no future to go back to. Right. So by not just restoring the past, but by actually being a part of it, there was a future for Kirk, Spock, and McCoy to go back to. We were successful. And Uhura has a smile on her face. Yes. Now- the look on Kirk's face, his jaw is clenched. He's not looking at anybody. And Spock and McCoy are looking at Kirk with different looks. Spock is looking at him with such relation of pain for his friend. McCoy is looking at Kirk like, I caused all this. Like, this is all, you know, sort of my fault, so right. to speak. If it wasn't for me, I never would have gone back in time. And my friend, Jim Kirk, would now be in such colossal pain and despair and grief. And, you know, the future has been restored. The Enterprise is back up there. The mission was a resounding success. It was a miracle. Scotty and Uhura are looking at the three of them with joy, but they see, they zero in mm -hmm. on the look on Kirk's face. I think the distance between Kirk struggling with his emotions right after Edith Keeler's death and the Kirk that comes back through the Guardian Forever is huge. The look on his face says not a thousand words, but a million words. And the, the smile in Uhura's face starts to fade. Yeah. Okay. And Scotty tilts his head. His expression is saying something is very, very wrong here. Something that's never happened before and all the time, all the terrible, difficult things that they've seen Kirk go through, they've never seen this expression on his face. You know, you were talking earlier right. about James Dillon, yeah. about how he's, he's such a terrific actor, his reactions. Mm -hmm. This is the reaction that really st stuck out at me as I watched Sitting on the Edge of Forever in later years. 
that reaction that Scotty gives him saying, oh boy, something is really, really, yeah. really wrong here. Time has resumed its shape. All is as it was before. Many such journeys are possible. Let me be your gateway. By the way, that's the other line that was intact from Harlow and Ellison's early teleplay. Captain, the Enterprise is up there. They're asking if we want to beam up. I love this setup. It's essentially setting up a choice. Here is the most interesting, fascinating possibility maybe they've ever encountered on the Enterprise, the ability to go back to any time or place they want. And we saw at the beginning, Kirk went, it just imagine it, being able to step through into history. And we saw the big smile he had on his face when they first showed up in 1930. And now the Guardian of Forever says, many such journeys are possible. Let me be your guide. And Uhura says, the Enterprise is up there asking if you want to beam up. What a perfect choice. And Kirk says, Let's get the hell out of here. His delivery of that line, he can barely say it above a whisper. It was the only time that the word hell was used as an expletive in the original series. Right. The word hell was used before. Kirk said it while quote, quoting Milton right. in Space Seed. And then there's Commodore Decker in uh, Doomsday Machine, right out of hell, I saw it. It was used a few times, but not as an expletive. So director Joseph Pevney had this to say about that final moment. Using hell in that last line was something of a problem. There were objections from the network. Roddenberry had a meeting with them and said, there is no other word which conveys the emotion of the moment. And of course, Bill Shatner fought for it too. We all wanted it in because it sounded so great. Finally, NBC said, what the hell? <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> um, I am so happy that Gene Kuhn didn't put a joke at the end of this episode. Oh, there's no way. There's no way. You can end this moment. You can't. Yeah. This is the most devastating ending in all of the original series, topping Charlie X. Well, because Kirk's our guy. Charlie X is this irritating, scary, disturbing, upsetting person who we feel bad for. Kirk's our hero. It's different. Of course, you know the original ending for this. Harlan Ellison. And this has been his bone of contention from the moment this was changed to the moment he left this earth in 2018. In the original version that Ellison wrote, Kirk does go to save Edith Cure and Spock stops him. Yeah, Harlan's wrong. Harlan is wrong. I think I say Harlan is wrong. This is a story. You give Kirk the choice, the dramatic choice. Are you going to save the life of the woman you love or are you going to let her die to save the universe? That is a dramatic choice. Having Spock do it, A, takes the choice out of Kirk's hands. You've actually betrayed your setup. And the other thing is it's horrible in their relationship. You know, of course, it's funny. There's, um, you know, the film, The Natural. Of course. Uh, in the, here's a spoiler, looks great movie. And in the end of The Natural, he's, they want him to throw the game and he's bleeding and he's wounded. And he has that last hit and makes the home run and he hits the, the lights and it shatters. And it's amazing. In the book, he throws the game. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And the book is wrong. I mean, the book is a much darker, uh, not fun <laughs> version of the story. It's like, this was the right, this was the destined ending. This is what had to happen. The fact that Kirk made that ultimate sacrifice is why we love him. Yep. It is his character. It defines his character that he chose the universe over his heart. Let me help. He helped restore the universe to its rightful timeline, at least in this timeline, because yeah. it's been messed up so many times since. But Kirk's actions made me admire him so much more. Yeah. I liked him so much more. It solidified so many of the reasons why to this day, to this day, as a grown-up middle-aged man, I still aspire to be like Kirk. I still ask myself, what would Kirk do? This is one of the great reasons why, because he made the ultimate sacrifice. It was the right choice. And the rewrites that were done were the right choices. Mm -hmm. Although in the original version, 
uh, Spock visits a grieving Kirk in his quarters and attempts to console him, saying, quote, no other woman was offered the universe for love. It's a good line. Well, remember it's that line at the end of Requiem Methusel for Methuselah when he when Spock gives Kirk the mind meld and he says, forget. Oh, yeah. You know, that was a nice moment. That's yeah. what this may be. I don't of. like that episode, but yeah, I know I don't like that episode <laughs> yeah. either, but it's a nice moment. Just like there was an aftermath to the alternative factor because John Drew Barrymore, you know, walked right. away from his job. There is an aftermath to the city on the edge of forever. So after all the rewrites that the screenplay went through, Harlan Ellison's agent asked that his writing credit read not Harlan Ellison, but Cord Wayner Bird. So Cord Wayner Bird is the pseudonym that Harlan Ellison used to alert his fans that he was not happy for being unjustly rewritten. Now, Ellison claimed that Gene Roddenberry threatened to have him blacklisted, so he kept his name on the script. Gene Roddenberry did not take a writing credit at all on this, even though he took a writing credit uh, on, on some other episodes. But Gene Roddenberry knew the importance of having a revered science fiction author having his name on the screenplay, on the written by of a Star Trek episode, even though Kuhn and uh, Fontana, even Stephen Karabatsis and Roddenberry himself, they all had a hand. They all could have been listed on that written by, but Roddenberry knew how important it was in 1967 to have Ellison's name there. Uh, and Ellison never forgave the Trek producers for rewriting him. Uh, and like I said, Ellison won his Writers Guild Award for his original script. And when he accepted the Writers Guild Award, he berated the studio executives and producers for interfering with the writing process while those producers were in the room. And he was shaking his fist as an award at the producers with Roddenberry. It was Gene Roddenberry, Herb Sal, and Bob Justman. And they just like shrugged their shoulders like, what are you going to do? But the fact is, Steve, if Ellison had not been rewritten, then this episode never would have been produced. Yeah. We would not have a city on the edge of forever. I definitely think if a writer says, take my name off of that thing, you shouldn't have their name on it. I don't think that was right. But I also think Harlan's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's their show. They get to read. That's, that's when you sign up to be a writer. And the fact is, this is not a disaster. This is the greatest episode of Star Trek. You should shut the hell up. Right. I mean, you know, you know? we're not, we're not talking, it's not like, you know, it started off as a city on the edge of forever and it ended up as Spock's brain. No. Like it ended up as like the greatest television yeah. episode ever, you yeah. know? And you could say like, I like my episode better. That's fine. But you can't say they did a bad job. This right. is, uh, no, yeah, they, I mean, they, did yeah. they did a great job. Yeah. They did a great job. Even Harlan Ellison. And if he can't, if he can't look at this episode and say that was a good episode of television, he's nuts. You know? I mean, listen, th this, this episode. Like it feels like Star Trek. It feels yeah. like a very, very special episode of Star yeah. Trek because it transcends like everything else. But at least it has the voice. It has the feel. The characters are the characters that we know and love. And 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 the fact that they made such a bold decision to have uh, Kirk stop McCoy versus Spock stopping Kirk was was just the, the greatest move of all. But as for a lot of lot of memories, a lot of uh, recollections about this episode, director Joseph Pevney said, essentially, City on the Edge of Forever was a motion picture. I treated it as a movie, as I did with all television, which is why all those acts feel so cinematic. Jerry Finnerman, the cinematographer, said, that was a wonderful show. I thought I lit it well. I thought <laughs> I had Joan Collins looking good. It was just good. Joan Collins was a wonderful lady, very professional. I really enjoyed working with her. Joan Collins in 1996 had this to say, to this day, people still want to talk to me about that episode. Some remember me for that more than anything else I've done. I'm amazed at the enduring popularity of Star Trek and particularly of that episode. I couldn't be more pleased or more honored to be part of Star Trek history. And in 2015, at the big Star Trek convention they have in Las Vegas, I moderated a stage conversation with Joan Collins. Wow. To be able to talk. I bet she was awesome. She was awesome. She was right sharp. She remembered everything. She was lovely. You know, of course, we talked about like Dynasty and her, yeah. you know, all that stuff. But 
to be in front of 4,000 Star Trek fans talking to Joan Collins about this episode That's cool. was a bucket list moment. DeForest Kelly said, I had a feeling about that show. I knew it was going to be a winner. It's one of the few times I wish I had been playing the Kirk role. <laughs> Dorothy Fontana, as much as she loved and admired and respected and was friends with Harlan Ellison, she said, for 30 years, I couldn't tell Harlan that I was one of the people who worked on that script. I was scared to death of him. <laughs> and we are going to give the last word to Harlan Ellison. From the great beyond, I've never loved that Star Trek. It's won awards and continues to be the most popular one. My response is, you should have seen the original. <laughs> well, you can't see the original because a few years ago, IDW, the comic book publisher, did a six-issue series called The City on the Edge of Forever, where they took Harlan Ellison's original wow. screenplay and made a comic book out of it. So if you want to see what the episode would have looked like, if you want to see what the Guardians of Forever and Beckwith and LeBeck and that final moment when Spock stops Kirk instead of Kirk stopping McCoy, you can look at The City on the Edge of Forever. You can also read Harlan Ellison's book called The City on the Edge of Forever, the original screenplay, which features an introduction that goes on for 90 pages, <laughs> 90 pages of profane vitriol that's repetitive, bitter, and really hard to get through, but it's really interesting read. What a deep dive, my friend. Yeah, I, I just, there's certain people where you just want to give them a hug and say, let it go, dude. And just let it go. Let it go, right? Let it go. But Steve, what are your final thoughts on sitting on the edge of forever? So I've been thinking about this. Um, I think we're almost at the end of the first season. And I think the there have been so many revelations about who James T. Kirk is. And the one that I was thinking about here, you know, there's one of the great moments of Kirk is Wrath of Khan and dealing with Spock's death. And he's talking to his son. You never have faced death. No, not like this. I've cheated death. I've tricked my way out of death and patted myself on the back for my ingenuity. It's a great moment in a great film. It's not true. He has faced death. In fact, one of the biggest revelations is that James T. Kirk is a tragic figure who has done nothing but sacrifice over and over again. You know, whether it's uh, Yeoman Rand, whether it's relationships that he left even before we met him, whether it's Carol Marcus, the moment at the end of Dagger of the Mind, there's this moment where McCoy goes, oh, you see, so you're okay. And Kirk goes, yeah, I'm okay. And then McCoy looks away and the camera stays on Kirk and you can see, no, he's not okay. Right. You're he's right. He's not okay. He has dealt with so much pain and so much sacrifice and so much the animosity towards him in court martial like there's so much pain this guy's gone through and this is the ultimate example well well after sitting on the edge of forever was there ever a character not including the one that he references in star trek generations that character on the horse at the end of the movie mm. who else qualifies as the love of kirk's life be besides Edith Keeler. I think Edith Keeler is the best. The only other one is like Miramani. Miramani from, uh, the from Paradise Syndrome. Paradise Syndrome. Right. Okay. Fair enough. That's that's a good point. But but I don't think she's Edith Keeler. I, I, you know, he has no memory then. That's the only woman he meets. Yes, he falls in love with her. I don't think it's, I don't think anything compares to Edith Keeler. And when he met Miramani, you know, memory His was His brain shot. was scrambled. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, was, it was not, he was not himself. Yeah. But he remembered her after he got his memory back. Yeah. Uh, which makes the end of that episode tragic, uh, just as tragic because she was pregnant. Yep. But this episode, for well, first of all, I don't care how many times you watch Sitting on the Edge of Forever, when you get to that moment at the end, it still packs a powerful punch just as much after 300 times as the first time. That moment when he pushes McCoy away, he can't even look at him. Yeah. That moment when Scotty and Uhura, their smiles fade and they realize something very, very heavy happened back in time. And, and again, just like when you realize the structure of the episode, how Edith doesn't even show up until halfway through the second act, and there's still plenty of time to establish their relationship, their dynamic. And you believe every ounce of the love and respect that they have for each other 
and you you feel every moment of Kirk's pain as he comes to the realization that she has to die. And when she does die, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And when it's over, it stays with you. Every time I watch this episode, it stays with me for for so long. And I just go, yep, that is absolutely the greatest Star Trek of them all. Still the best Star Trek time travel story, even though I love like yesterday's Enterprise from Next Generation. I love the Voyage Home, Star Trek Four, But Sitting on the Edge of Forever will forever be the greatest Star Trek of them all. So I've enjoyed this conversation so much, and I can't wait for all of you to join this conversation. Please visit us on our social media. You can search for us on Facebook. You can follow the show at Enter Incidents on Twitter, on Enterprise Incidents on Instagram. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, Spotify. Leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. You know what? The reviews have slowed down a little bit lately, and I feel like we're just heating up. So we would love, you like the show, please leave a review. Leave your comments on YouTube. Scott, if people wanted to find you on social media, how would they do that? Okay. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Movie Mance. And you can check us out on our Facebook page, which is Enterprise Incidents. Make sure you leave your comments, your thoughts on our Facebook page. Make sure you like and follow our Facebook page so you can see all the breaking news about the developments of our next episode of Enterprise Incidents. And you can chime in on your thoughts of our current episode of Enterprise Incidents. So please let us know what you think. And just like Steve said, very, very important, please go to Apple Podcasts and leave your reviews. Those are the the reviews and the reactions and the feedback that really help us stand out so more people can discover Enterprise Incidents. And to that extent, please make sure you share Enterprise Incidents with your fellow Star Trek fans, whether they are diehard fans of the original series or even casual ones. We've gotten so much feedback from people who never really watched the original series, but are now watching it in production order along with us, watching the episode and then listening to our podcast. And Steve, how can people find you on social media? Well, they can find me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And if you're interested in more doomed love stories, you could go to the cinephiles and check out our episodes on West Side Story, Vertigo, Chinatown, and Casablanca. And while you are at the cinephiles, which is the best deep dive discussion on movies that Steve hosts with John Roca, and you love time travel. You can also check out their Cinephiles episode on Back to the Future. Absolutely. Or The Terminator, also time travel movies. Lots, lots, lots of great movies on the Cinephiles, including our deep dives on Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. By the way, we haven't discussed this, but I have a feeling when we get to the end of the original series, we are going to do Star Trek III, Star Trek IV, and Star Trek V. Uh, I would say that is essential. The best is yet to come. Can't believe we are almost finished with season one, Steve. It feels like we just started doing this. The very last episode of the first season, which is next on Enterprise Incidents, is Operation Annihilate. The last episode of season one, which means we are going to be 30 episodes into Enterprise Incidents and a third of the way, more than a third of the way through our deep dive on the original series. Operation Annihilate is next on Enterprise Incidents. Join us, and until then, keep going boldly.